see if everyone can turn on your cameras. ready to begin. Uh, happy to do. Two. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to the 2.30 p.m. session of the February 22nd, 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council. I would like to ask the clerk to please call roll. Mayor, Councilmember Salantari Johnson. Here. Councilor? Here. Thank you. Here. Brown. Here. Myers. Here. Vice Mayor Watson. Here. Mayor Brunner. Present. Thank you. Our first item on the agenda is a Parking for Hope tech presentation. And I'd like to invite Heather Perez, Program Director of Hope Services, to turn on the camera. Oh, great. There you are. And there's, hi, everybody. So thank you for joining us, for being here today. So I have a little something I'd like to read. And then I'll give you an opportunity to say anything you'd like to say. Very well. So Hope Services, as you know, is a valuable Santa Cruz nonprofit that provides training and support services to adults with developmental disabilities. Your crews have helped to keep our downtown sidewalks and streets clean and welcoming yeah. for 20 years now. Each holiday season, our Parking for Hope program, in partnership with the Downtown Association, donates all of the funds collected from our downtown parking meters over eight days in December to Hope Services. This is in support of and appreciation for all that they do. Today we have with us Hope Services Hope Services Director Heather Perez, Hope Services Employment Coordinator David Forante, and the downtown crew members Mark, Eric Brembor, Sarah Reed, Sandra Schofield, and Anthony Van Tim. Did I forget anyone? Sounds like we got everybody, Sonia. Thank you. Great. I'm pleased to virtually present you all with a check from our eighth annual Parking for Hope program in the amount of $50,982. This brings the total amount collected for Hope Services over eight years is $218,000. We are so grateful for your important work and hope that this donation will help it to continue. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to say? Yeah, um, I would just like to say um, I'm, I'm Heather Perez. I'm the program manager uh, from Hope for Hope Services. And I just want to say we Hope Services want to thank uh, the um, school and the city of Santa Cruz for the Parking for Hope fundraiser. Um, it keeps five of our participants um, working in their community, um, and this contribution helps um, our program running and employs our participants um, to continue to keep um, our city beautiful. And um, you know, the, it it's, means a lot to them, um, part of their community and working in their community. So thank you so much. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I'll see you downtown. Okay, let's do that. Let's do that. 
Thank you, everybody. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. 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 I will now move on to our next item. This is also a presentation. It's a presentation from Santa Cruz Mountain Trail Volunteers. And I'd like to invite Emma Usat, the Trail Program Manager, and Santa Cruz Mountains Trail Stewardship. Emma, um, Mayor, I don't hear a call. She's not here with us yet. Emma and the attendees know. Okay, I don't see Emma either. We can come back to this item if need be. Okay. Yeah, I, I'm going to send her a quick email. And Great, thank you so much. much. I will um, move on to a few announcements then, and um, then we will move on to the regular meeting. So today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an item on the agenda today, you can call in in the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen with your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's your time for public comment, please raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting the raise hand feature in the webinar controls on your Please note that public comment is heard only on council items that council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbers eight through 14 on our agenda. I'd like to ask council members if there are any statements or disqualifications today. None. I'd like to ask the clerk to announce any additions and deletions. There are none. I'd like to now call on the city attorney, Tony Condotti, to provide a report on our closed session. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Mayor Bruner, members of the city council. Uh, the city council met uh, via Zoom this afternoon in closed session to uh, discuss the following items. Item one was a conference with legal counsel regarding liability claims, uh, specifically the claim of Andrew John Hansen, uh, the council received a report from the city attorney's office and the risk management department, uh, and by unanimous vote, the council approved a settlement of that liability claim in the amount of $58,530.42. Item two was a conference with legal counsel involving existing litigation. The council received a report from the city attorney's office on the case uh, entitled Don't Morph the Wharf, the City of Santa Cruz um, Council uh, received a report from the City Attorney's Office on that item, as well as on item three, which was a conference with legal counsel involving uh, significant exposure to litigation. Uh, other than the liability claim, there was no reportable act. Thank you. Any other the City Council will now review the meeting calendar attached to the agenda. 
and revise it as necessary. And I'll call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no. This is now the time for council members to report out on actions at external board committees and joint powers authority meetings. For future meetings, come prepared to provide an update on any meetings or actions that occurred since the last council meeting so that the council and public can be informed. And I will call on council member Myers. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, yeah, I just have one. Um, uh, I'm going to let Mayor uh, Jones. No, we haven't had a message that last, I don't believe. Um, but I will uh, give an update on Central Coast Energy. Uh, there are uh, additional cities that have joined. Um, city of um, Bulbang has recently joined. Um, and the, yeah, uh, also, um, the board is in the middle. The last, our last meeting was last week, and the board um, received a, a basically a recommendation by the staff to cut back the roles and responsibilities of the advisory, which was a foundational part of the agency when it was formed in terms of how uh, input from the communities that are members of. That um, was not well received by the board, and there was a vote. And um, there has been an ad hoc committee set up to review, review that those proposals by the staff also be looked at by laws of the advisory committee. There was about 90 people that showed up all over from all the membership uh, counties and cities, and uh, about a two and a half hour presentation, and it ended in the right place without moving. Or the staff's recommendations, changes in the bylaws, and um, some of the duties and responsibilities. Um, so that was uh, one of the more um, the longer or, or longer discussions we had. The, ag the agency as a whole is becoming uh, much more focused on sort of ability aspects of the of the agency, and there's a lot of around losing the workforce development and the climate change goals and some of the other things that people, um, community members feel really were why they embraced this form of having a community energy agency. So I think there's going to be quite a bit of work done in the next um, And I expressed our need and our interest in workforce development, uh, local jobs, and maintaining to change green jobs as a priority. So I think a lot of about that. Tune in or get a hold of me if you're interested. But there's a, a very, very active public life changing a little bit in, away from what, what the benefits. Um, so there's a there it will be a strategic planning session annual number, but uh, I would imagine over the next uh, two quarters. That is my report. Thank you. Thank you so much, Council Member Brown. Uh, I'll uh, a quick report as the. Primary item of interest on at least the one of the missions I am on the Regional Transportation Commission was discussed at our last meeting, and uh, I think we'll have a more of a sense now of what that conversation is at the commission, and then how that fits with the wider community conversation about the, the rail right of way. Uh, but we did have a transportation policy workshop that gave an opportunity for our staff. To 
and also uh, the staff from the different from the county and the cities of Watsonville and Santa Cruz. So Ryan was there uh, to give us an update on the segments of the rail trail planning that are happening uh, further and south of us. So from the segments eight, um, well, oh, oh, 12. Um, and it was really interesting. The um, I th I was looking to see if the slides are up on the RT website, and I can't find them, but they are. They should be, and if they're not, they will be soon. Um, it had it provided a, some really visual representations of the kind of engineering work that um, is possible and and likely necessary to continue with the build out of the the rail trail. And um, the presentation was intended to give us a sense of so the overall what that looked like for the, the full build out, but also to talk about potential for an interim phase trail only portion, some of the more problematic areas in particular um, related to the, the trestle, capital trestle and uh, further south, which we talked about. So um, it was it was great. It was it was really interesting. We had a good conversation and that information. That should be available if you want to see what um, you know the, the renderings of, of what it um, kind of the structurally what what it might look like, and it really helped me understand the the opportunity. Um, so that was uh, RTC, and then the AAA, the area on aging thing. We had ongoing conversation about uh, countywide effort to develop a master plan for aging playbook and uh, more come on that from uh, related to the, what the city's role um, currently is and, and could be moving forward. Um, I think I will stop my report. Now. Um, I'll let uh, one of my colleagues from the revenue committee report on that. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just to pick up where Council Member Brown was um, touching on the RTC, I serve as an alternate from the Metro Board, and the presentation um, was really wonderful and detailed and thorough, and it is up on the website. Um, it's, uh, it's, well, it's really long, the URL, but if you go into the, the 222 presentation link, it's up there. Um, so I, I don't have a lot to report because a lot of my committees and, and commissions have not met since our last meeting. Uh, I will say that the Metro Board, as, as Councilmember Myers um, stated, is meeting on Friday, and we are also then spending the afternoon doing CEO interviews. So um, some leadership changes there. So we'll have something to report, hopefully, when we'll, the next time we come together. And then I have met with members of the Youth Action Network. And we are um, discussing identification of a youth liaison. Um, we adopted that last uh, winter, have a youth liaison from the Youth Action Network uh, connected to us and help. All the other committees will be meeting in the next. Thank you. 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 Thank you committee meeting and um, that was I think pretty much right after our last meeting if I remember correctly and we kind of set monthly meeting dates and priorities we got an interesting update in regards to fires that I, I found particularly interesting and it was um, just kind of from Chief Hayu or um, Chief Odie and it was from you know 2017 there was 63 fires and then in 2020, it was up to 141, and then in 21, it was down to 134. And so it was interesting uh, that they were all human caused. And uh, with the last year, there was, I believe, 25 arrest, um, arrests and six convictions. And there was an update about the NFPA um, Firewise Community Groups, and we had a criminal justice report. Um, and maybe my colleagues can fill in anything else that was notable that I left out. We um, did not have a city schools meeting, although we had it on the calendar, um, but we did get together uh, um, 
internally. So we haven't met with the with the superintendent or the school board members, but we talked a little bit about um, allocation of the children's fund and um, priorities in regards to scholarships and also providing personnel to help with after school recreation at the elementary school sites um, to complement the programs that are already existing. We talked a little bit about the fencing that's happening at the Santa Cruz City Schools campuses and ways that we can help seek funding to open the campuses either on weekends or other times when school's not in session for the community to enjoy those recreation spaces. And in addition, um, the ad hoc election subcommittee met, and I believe there'll be more information about that later, so I'll leave it there. But feel free to fill in anything I forgot about public safety or city schools. Okay, thanks. That's Thank it. you. Thank you, Councilmember. Hi, Councilmember Cumming. Mayor, so um, LACO, uh, one of the action items, Oak Cliffs uh, Recreation District. Um, we had an item that was initiated by the Oak Cliffs Recreation District back in August requesting dissolution and incorporation of CSA 11 and Parks and Recreation District. Um, within this annexation, there's a um, number of parcels that are in Capitola, and these areas would be excluded. Parks and services being provided by the state of Capitola. Uh, for those areas. Um, AMBAG, we had two reports. One was on the an annual comprehensive financial report for fiscal year 2021, and then the Rural Regional Energy Network presentation. Um, for the Public Safety Committee, just kind of filling a couple gaps. Um, uh, Council members Watkins is the chair, will remain chair, with Council Member Golder as the vice chair. Um, and then just a, a little bit of a follow-up did outline a number of different items um, that we will be that we will have in a six month work plan. So kind of in addition to um, setting regular meetings, uh, we did also put a number of items uh, forward to go into a work plan and this can all be found on the uh, city's public safety website. Um, and we did go over the report that came out of the Criminal Justice Council uh, related to police policies regionally uh, that touch on use of force, accountability, uh, technology. And um, while we didn't take any action uh, at that meeting, uh, I would uh, recommend other council members who haven't reviewed that report already to maybe do so. And if there's any policy changes that we might want to align with um, that we had that we're not in alignment with the, uh, other regions of the county that we may want to take a look at and consider those policies as well. Um, although I know that a lot of the question kind of built off some of the changes that we had made here in Santa Cruz during 2020. So that concludes uh, my update on general presentation. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown, did you have any additions? I did have one other thing that I completely forgot. If it's okay to just yes, jump in here, go I think ahead. It, I think it'll be um, it, it's it's useful and and interesting also for the public, the listening public. Um, I forgot uh, that I did attend the Monterey Bay Air Resources District Board meeting. I've returned to that board uh, after uh, some time off, and uh, we had a good meeting. Uh, but the one item I wanted. To highlight was the uh, MBARD electric bicycle incentive program, which uh, was launched last fall and um, is and this provides incentive to low-income applicants in Monterey, Santa Cruz, and San Benito counties in the MBARD region to purchase electric bicycles. And um, it has been underutilized, the, the program. We did make some changes the eligibility requirements to make it a little bit easier for to ex expand the pool of potential applicants. So if you are um, interested, anyone out there who's interested, it's, you know, it's a great program. And we also were 
uh, advised at that meeting that this uh, incentive program can be stacked with uh, uh, e-bike incentive program. So it can be a significant uh, portion of the cost towards an e-bike. And people can go to the MBARD website to find out more information um, at mbard.org. From there, you can scroll down and find electric bicycle incentive program link uh, for more information on how to on the eligibility guidelines and thank you great uh okay vice chair watkins uh yeah no i think let me just see if i have anything really to add all of my colleagues have really touched on a lot of our mutual committees um the only thing i i guess i could add is that you'll all in our community will be presented by the revenue committee with some um, proposals moving forward in the next couple of meetings or the next meeting, so that will be forthcoming. And then in regards to our charter amendment committee, that is an item that's on for us this afternoon. Um, lastly, just that the two by two continues to meet to really think about how we can align our our resources and leverage our uh, various uh, resources so that we can work towards solutions to homelessness and really trying to get into some of those um, just nitty, nitty gritty around what's working and what could be improved. And then, yeah, just in terms of we're coming, we do have a public safety meeting coming right up as well as our community programs. So much more to add other than that. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. Um, <clears throat> I'll just add a couple of um, items. Our Health and All Policies Committee meeting met for the first time and uh, kind of outlined the, the year with some topics from the direction that was given last year by council. And um, using the Public Safety Committee um, um, as uh, a, a committee to kind of explore some of the health and all policy items, um, looking at data reports and metrics. And um, <clears throat> looking forward to uh, Lauren Gare and um, needing to research and, and find more information about that. Um, and researching and recruitment and compensation of um, BIPOC folks and committees and commissions. Um, uh, I think also around looking at issues and items around harassment, um, discrimination and respectful workplace conduct, city workforce and demographics data, and reviewing the arts commissions um, initial recommendations made for later on in the year, a DEI statement from the city and um, kind of reviewing an annual progress report. Um, so just kind of a rough outline for that committee. Um, and if, uh, let's see, Council Member Voluntary Johnson, if, if I left any, you know. Um, also the two by two, committee meeting met and um, we had um, items that we discussed were shelter capacity, navigation center, the armory, um, home key update and um, housing and program capacity um, inside and outside of the city. Uh, discussions related to the $14 million funds that we will be receiving uh, towards homelessness and, and um, also some recent grants that the Santa Cruz County has received. Um, one of them related to the rehousing wave services. And I think that was a million dollars and you know, the rehousing wave is uh, an effort to support guests and um, there were uh, housing vouchers made available 
um, through the Housing Authority of the, the County of Santa Cruz um, <clears throat> to support this effort. And uh, for the update was that there were 51 units leased with available vouchers and 224 additional households have been approved for vouchers and are searching for housing. And so more property owner involvement and support is needed. Um, there was encampment response discussions, outreach model and organizing outreach and homeward bound flexible funding um, discussed and um, the our we are putting together our city um, is putting together a homelessness response plan and so uh, we talked about that and I know that the city and county staff have been meeting as well to coordinate and leverage resources the county side on services and the city side so that should be coming up next month in our March meeting. And um, our visit Santa Cruz, um, I did uh, attend the retirement um, acknowledgement for Maggie Ivy, the former CEO who is now retired and on behalf of the city of Santa Cruz, I presented a certificate of appreciation um, to her and all her efforts in tourism for the county and the city of Santa Cruz. And um, um, just a reminder that last year, Mayor Myers did present a mayor proclamation to the city um, to her as well. So um, that's probably all that I have. Does anybody have anything else? Wonderful. Well, I did see Emma Usat arrive, and so I will go back to item number five, Santa Cruz Mountains Trail Stewardship Volunteers. Welcome, Emma. Thank you for Hi. joining us. Thanks for having me. I have a really quick presentation. Wonderful. Uh, share. Um, let's see. Oops, not that share. Other share. Mm -hmm. And uh, feel free to interrupt me throughout, ask questions. That is quick, short, and sweet. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Thanks for having me here. Cool. So this is a little snippet from Santa Cruz Mountains Trail Stewardship SCMTS's annual report. We have a much longer report if you want me to share. But uh, I tried to focus on just City of Santa Cruz part. So these were our stats here in terms of trail stewardship. And just a reminder for anyone listening who doesn't know, we are the local 501c3 nonprofit trail stewardship organization. So we're a nonprofit that builds, maintains a lot of different trails in the county with different land agencies, including City of Santa. Anyway, uh, last year, uh, we were really excited because we got to work in a lot of new places, but one of the staff I wanna call out here is that we had 80% first time volunteers last year out of 467 unique volunteers. And I thought that was really cool. Um, as a lot of folks know, since our rebrand last year, we were branded from Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz to Santa Cruz Mountains Trail Stewardship. And because of that, we've seen a really big increase in our trail user demographic, which is really exciting and a huge goal of ours. So it's starting to even out a bit more at our events in terms of um, what types of trail users are getting involved in trail stewardship which is what we were hoping for. Um, for a quick project rundown, one of the big projects we partnered with the city of Santa Cruz on last year was the West Side Pump Track. I just went past it today, and every single time I would go past it, it's just packed with kids, families, and all different types of uh, pump track users, which is really cool. Um, it was so great to partner with the city on this and um, you know, to make a sustainable pump track before it was kind of just an eyesore uh, because there's not water available on site and um, it was always all dry. And so now having it paved, um, having it be a more fun and usable track 
is always crowded, which is so great. We actually have a trail counter. So if anyone wants to know how many people use it, I can probably find that. Actually, I already see um, 35,000 visits since uh, we built it in August of 2021. Very cool. And uh, one thing I'll just mention is that for anyone listening who doesn't know, we partnered with the city of Santa Cruz to redesign it, uh, reconstruct the pump track, and we also raised a few million dollars or not a few million, a few hundred thousand dollars to help build. Cool, on to trail programs. That's what I mostly do. So we do a lot of public events because a big part of our mission is connecting the public to trail stewardship. Um, last year was really exciting because after a, over a year long hiatus, we brought back our big flagship events called Dig Days. And Dig Days are these large trail work events where we have about 60 people come out and we cap the events they always sell out, and we um, provide breakfast and lunch and a post-dig raffle and beverages and snacks, and um, everyone comes out and does trail work with us. Uh, we did a few in city parks. Uh, here's some pictures from an improvement we did through a dig day on University Connector Trail in Pogonip. Um, throughout the years, we've been tackling some pretty big projects on the trails. A lot of them due to natural springs that are just near the trail or poor drainage. And so here's where we installed some rock into the trail. This required a lot of wheelbarrow load, um, bringing in the rock, and then of course, installing it properly so it'll last forever. Here are some photos from De La Viega, where we rerouted a tiny bit of trail to avoid this um, natural rutting that was occurring. You can see all the happy volunteers. I think that was our student stick day on Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service. And then here's just an example from a dig day we did on Emma McCurry Trail. And this is kind of also showing um, what we send to our volunteer trail crew leaders who are helping lead events or lead volunteers at these events where you know we're showing them where to install a drain, the after photo. So big improvements all around. More examples, this is from University Connector Trail of the instructions for sending about stone pitching and something that we added this year which is really helpful is all of our events have um, a map online now where we flag out what we're going to do and where we're going to do it with instructions and we've seen that's been a huge improvement for our volunteers helping do all this work so here's just a few of the awesome reviews we got from city park um, this year, we so far, last year, we got 330 participants to write back in our volunteer feedback form, which was really amazing because, as you probably saw, we only had 457 unique volunteers, so a lot of people responded. And out of um, five out of five ratings, we got a 4.9 average. Pretty good. So we're doing something right. Um, the common themes I saw were that our staff and crew leaders are awesome. Our that people love giving back to the community. Um, people really like meaningful work. The events were super organized. People enjoyed learning and they were fun. I did want to highlight, this is really important to me, that we still have work to do. So for me, the really valuable responses were the few that actually provided some feedback that on things we need to work on. So the comments I saw were diversity, education, and creating more efficiency. Um, we spend a lot of time giving instructions at the beginning. And then also, of course, Quizno. So these are things we're gonna be working on in 2022. I realize I'm probably gonna go over comments. I'm gonna try not to. <laughs> we also worked with the city every year. We have for the last few years through the summary trail crew. Um, so Santa Cruz Mountains Trail Stewardship uh, staff helped lead the program. City helped fund um, the cruise staff, the cruise time, and then also part of our uh, crew leaders staff time. So Katie is super badass. She's our trail stewardship coordinator. She led all of these students who had a really great time. Um, they got to work in so many different parks, Moore Creek, um, the Harvey West Pump Track, and the McCray Trail University Connector. Um, all over the place. This is from Arana Gulch where they got to install fencing and they had a great time. And then this is another program we introduced last year called Trail Stages and it's kind of um, a graduate 
a graduate program for our volunteer trail crew leaders. So these are actually volunteers that we trust so much. They're practically staff and they can lead volunteer events on their own. Um, and they've gone through a lot of training and it's been a huge success so far. They're actually leading two events a week right now on their own. And we've been teaching trail academy classes at every single dig day this year. So we taught 20 classes last year. Um, we had 422 attendees and they also have a 4.9 out of 5 average. One last thing I wanted to touch on was that we also made two different trail tip series. So trail etiquette was a big theme of last year. And I think it's, a, and I hope it's the way we brought a lot of value for our partners. Um, this picture on the left is an example of one of the trail tips geared towards mountain bikers uh, that we got a lot of partners to share and have been spreading throughout the year. And then the one on the right is one of our pump track trail tip series. So we have two different series right now, one for multi-use trails and one for pump tracks, um, just with the goal of spreading awareness about trail etiquette. We saw a lot of new uh, recreationalists last year throughout the pandemic, and we are trying to encourage good trail etiquette whenever we can. I'll skip over these kind of boring. Yes, we're doing well in terms of um, increasing our membership, our digital reach. And so through that, we're able to share more of the education that we're, that I was just talking about. So yeah, looking forward um, this year, decided to increase stewardship through more adopt trail partnerships with the city of Santa Cruz, improve trail etiquette, more education, trainings, and updated signage. Um, we want to keep improving trails for all trail users. And also, we really want to increase the diversity of our volunteers, participants, staff, and board plus all the other programs that just went over. <laughs> so that's it. And I'll leave my email in the comments and please feel free to send me a message if you have more questions or ask me questions Thank right you now. Thank so much. Emma, can you also verbally say the best way to connect uh, with the stewardship program? Where would that be? Yeah, so you can go to all of our um, channels, our Santa Santa Cruz Trails, so you can find us on social media through Santa Cruz Trails, or our website is santacruztrails.org, or you can email me directly at emma, E-M-M-A, at santacruztrails.org. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. It looks like we have uh, Council Member Colder has a question. Hi. Hi, not a question, just a comment. I just wanted to thank you for all the work that you do. And I see you guys out there. I hike a few times a week and I really appreciate all the work that goes into maintaining our existing trails. And um, it's it doesn't go unnoticed that, you know, we, we, we really appreciate you. So thank you. Hey, thanks so much. And I should really share, we have a link. We record all the work we do on Trail Fork. So if you want to read through that, I'll be sure to share that. Thank you. Uh Councilmember Myers. Yeah, and I just wanted to say thank you also. Um, been watching you guys grow this organize, organization for a long time since I was on the Parks Commission. And, you know, the trails in Santa Cruz really are, you know, just a testament to your guys' great work and the fact that, you know, you're involving trails. So, congratulations. Great to hear from you and everything that you guys are doing. So, thanks for being part of the city and helping care of our. Uh, Facebook property. Hey, thanks so much. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Yes, I'll echo those sentiments. Thanks for the presentation and all the work. And um, the loved to death um, tracks on the west side are loved to death by my children. So thank you so much for that. Awesome. Great. Yeah, and please feel free to also reach out if you have notice anything on the trails, we like to keep the pulse on trails, if you have advice or ideas, always open. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Emma. Thanks for joining us today. Bye. Bye. Okay. We will now continue on with our agenda. Uh, we are at the consent agenda. The consent agenda uh, let's see, items 8 through 12, and 
I'll just quickly list item eight is the minutes of the February 8th, 2022 city council meeting. Item nine is cybersecurity event monitoring and managed security service provider. Item 10 is an award contract for on-call land surveying services, public work. Item 11 is Chestnut Street Street storm drain replacement and pavement rehabilitation, also public work. And item 12 is leachate booster bypass upgrade project. Um, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items 8 through 12. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device. Raise your hand by either dialing star 9 on your phone or by selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any item? Seeing none. If there are any members of the public that would like to speak, now is the time to do so. I will go out to the public and see if there are any hands raised. Star 9 to raise your hand or raise hand in your webinar controls on your computer. Okay, I don't see any. I will come back to the council and um, I'm now looking for a motion. Uh, Vice Mayor Watkins? Yeah, I'm happy to move our consent agenda. Okay, and um, Council Member Brown? Second. We have a first by Vice Mayor Watkins and a second by Council Member Brown. And can the city clerk for roll call vote, please? Member Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Sir? Aye. 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 Brown? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Hi. Consent agenda items passed unanimously. Okay. Moving on, next up on our agenda is item number 13, Board of Building and Fire Appeals Appointment. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you wish to comment on, now is the time to call in on this item using the instructions on your screen. We will begin with questions from council, if there are any, then we will take a public comment and then turn to the council for nominations and voting to appoint someone to the board of inquire. So I'd like to, uh, Turn it over to our city clerk, Bonnie Bush. I guess you could just in for public comment and come back to see if anyone has it on. Okay, let's go out to. Public comment, I don't see any hands raised. Okay. So I will come back to council. 
and council member coming i have a question i was just wondering because i know for the other when we have um mission appointments oftentimes commissioners are invited to kind of speak to the council before we make decisions i'm just wondering if they would have been reached to or was able to comment because uh, like a, a lot of the applications it kind of says like i've been working in buildings and construction for x amount of years and so for a number of the applicants it seems like similar applications have been submitted so it's kind of difficult to get a sense of what differentiates the different candidates so i'm just wondering if anybody had been contacted or wanted to plan on being here for this part of the meeting do you mean applicants yeah, the majority of the applicants were actually part of the annual appointment process. If you remember, this was one group where we appointed and then we withheld one of the appointments to get more qualified applicants. I do know that staff um, was going to reach out to sort of um, their recommendation. I don't know if they did that or not, but I know that there are um, Applicants that there. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, so I will. I will just go around to council member and ask for nominations. So I will start with Council Member Brown. So based on the applications, um, I uh, I would nominate uh, Scott Scott Rogers. Scott Rogers. Okay, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I'd like to nominate Monica Ratliff. Okay. Council member coming. No new additions. Council member Golder. No, no additions. Vice Mayor Watkins. No addition. Council Member Myers. Uh, I would nominate uh, Wilson. And my nomination is Christian Nielsen. Okay. So, okay, so you're. Uh, so the um, the three nominated. Candidates are Christian Nielsen, Monica Ratliff, Scott Rogers. Okay. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Monica Ratliff. Sure. I always feel so much pressure. I feel I feel like everyone. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for for um, wanting to serve. Um, um, Monica Ratliff. Rogers. Brown. Scott Rogers. Meyer. Uh, Christian Nielsen. Vice Mayor Watkins. Monica Ratliff. Brenner. Christian Nielsen. Monica Ratliff got three of the votes. Wonderful. Thank you to all the applicants. And thank you to Monica Ratliff. That completes the appointment to the Board of Building and Fire Appeals with a term ending January 1st, 2023. We will now move on our agenda item 
Next up on our agenda item is item number 14, resolution ordering on the ballot for the June 7, 2022 primary election, a proposed charter amendment to create six districts and an at-large directly elected mayor. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be one, a presentation of the item by the council members who brought forward the item, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and return to council for deliberation and action. So I'd like to now turn it over for presentation. And who would like to begin the presentation? Mayor, I'll chime in. Actually, um, Casey Hamard, who's the staff important lead for us on this item, as members, they have, you will present, you'll be presenting the card. Thank you so much. I'd like to invite Casey Hamard to begin the presentation. Thank you, Mayor Brunner. Can you all see my PowerPoint presentation? Yes. Thank Perfect. You. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Casey Hemard, and I'm part of the team in the city manager's office who's helping with the city's transition to district elections. And I've been helping with this since November. I'm going to start by giving you a little bit of background and telling you some of the work that the Council Ad Hoc Committee on Election-Related Issues has been doing and give you uh, some background on the proposal that the committee's bringing to you. So the council has actually been working on this issue for two years now. In May of 2020, the council uh, passed a res resolution indicating um, intention to transition to district elections by the November 20. 22 general municipal election. And then late last year in November, the council created an ad hoc committee for elections related issues to look at a host of issues. The committee has met a couple of times uh, this year and um, early on recognized that this transition to district elections is significant and historic. And the committee was very interested from the beginning in giving the, the voters an opportunity to voice what this change could look like. And whether it's a six district situation with an at-large directly elected mayor, or where we would have seven districts as we are proceeding right now. The early analysis from experts did not did not provide a clear, uh, legally permissible way for the city to transition to six districts with an at-large mayor in time for the November 2022 election. However, further research and analysis did uh, pave the way for, for a potential path. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what that looks like. If the city council opts to pursue this uh, ballot measure. The first track is that the council would pass a resolution placing a charter amendment on the June ballot that would create six districts and an at-large directly elected mayor. The council would need to pass that resolution by March 11th in order for it to qualify for the June ballot. In the second track, the, the city would need to continue moving on the current process for the California Voting Rights Act, um, where we would do broad, we're doing broad, broad public outreach, several public hearings on the maps, and then the council chooses a district map. The difference here would be that in addition to choosing a seven district map, the council would also choose a six district map. And so if the ballot measure passed, then the six district map would prevail. And if it did not pass, the seven district map would prevail, and that would go into effect for the November election. As the committee was 
looking at this, um, you know, they, they seemed very interested in making sure that the voters have the choice of what this looks like. There was also the consideration of stewardship of resources, having one public outreach process, as opposed to say multiple public outreach processes over multiple election cycles, if this was something that was hunted down the road. In terms of the substance of the charter amendment proposal, um, in addition to creating six districts and an at-large directly elected mayor, makes a few other changes including updating the rules on term limits, the duties of the mayor, how council vacancies are handled, and it creates a two round election system, which, which would be like a runoff election, beginning with the 2024 election cycle. So that's all the background that I have for you all right now. I'm gonna now turn it over to the ad hoc committee members so that they can share their insights. Thank you, Casey Shimar. I I will turn it over to back to my screen there, um, Councilmember Myers, and then Vice Chair Watt. And you're muted. We've muted. Uh, thank you, Mayor, and thank you, um, Casey, for the uh, presentation. And um, I just couple of comments from my colleagues. Um, uh, you know, as we dug into this, um, what we really realized was that, you know, we are on track um, the, via the settlement agreement and already have an extension on transitioning seven districts. Um, we looked at a lot of other cities and what they had done um, as they were transitioning to collections. Um, have the good fortune of actually having a new city manager who has worked now has worked in a city where districts are in place uh, and receive um, you know some good input from him as well as our um, as well as our legal staff. I want to recognize Casey Bronson. She's been really working hard on this. I know she's on vacation this week, but um, our city attorney's office very very helpful as well as we kind of made our way through this. Um, and we decided some of the things that were assigned to the ad hoc committee should continue, especially the ranked choice voting uh, assessment and bringing that back, as well as um, the other the other methods that some some communities are testing. But at the end of, I think we've met three times at the really at the end of each meeting, we just kept coming back to the importance of, you know, bringing this to our voters as quickly as possible. Um, because as you get into district elections and this, you know, some of the things we've learned from other communities, uh, it's very hard to take a district away from anyone um, once once they're in place, once they run for office. It's very hard to go backwards or change districts um, once you've started down the road of, of, seven, of seven districts. It's not to say that that isn't a viable and perfectly fine outcome for our community, but um, we feel it's this at this point in time is a very important ask and answer. Um, I will state for our community, just in case folks aren't um, haven't had a time to look at the the actual charter amendment. Um, this does really does not change the duties of our mayor, um, and I, I can have Tony uh, comment on this a little bit more. This continues to maintain of what this, the mayor has been charged with correctly in this uh, agenda, you know, agenda setting and agenda development it does, however, provide council members to also put uh, an item on the agenda. So we very much wanted to keep in with the traditions that people are used to in terms of the mayor um, and what the mayor does, its responsibilities. Um, it also maintains our city manager form of government does not change our uh, our uh, structure to a strong mayor, as some people heard that term. Um, but uh, so those two things, I think, are very important for the voters and for uh, our colleagues to understand that um, this very much is in keeping with how the mayor has functioned in general 
uh, the big changes are is that the term would be a four-year term for the mayor. Um, it would be at large elected, uh, and we've set a, a consecutive year's uh, process whereby been running uh, for city council could serve as a council member for two years, uh, excuse me, for two four-year terms, but then um, they could also run for two four-year terms mayor and again looking at similar cities um both of population but more importantly of issues this consecutive leadership training as a council member before becoming an elected mayor seems to be a very common comment across many cities um it's not to say that someone you know couldn't be elected into mayor right right out of the bat that would be allowable as well but um this idea of having those experience that experience and really understanding how to how to be an effective um, council member as well as as well when you're during a mayor run is something we thought should be captured. Um, other than that, I don't believe there's any um, many changes away from sort of the existing uh, role of the mayor in terms of, like I said, setting the agenda, et cetera. Um, so I just wanted to point those out quickly. Um, uh, appreciate the ability to dig into this, and we hope supported by our colleagues. Important, very, very important question to bring to the voters. That's really you know, the best way to get public input is let's put it on the ballot for voters. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Uh, Vice Chair Watkins, you had a question. Uh, yeah, I just want to also thank Council Member Myers for further clarifying what's before our council and before the community in terms of what we're bringing forward. I too wanna to thank our staff for uh, the meetings and just all of the various scenarios that we went through to land in this place. I think at times all of our heads might've been spinning in terms of just timelines and parallel tracks. And ultimately we as a committee landed on wanting to use this unique opportunity, this unique sort of time in our city's history to really bring forward this option to our community to vote on. Um, anecdotally, I've heard, you know, interest in wanting to see this move forward. And regardless if this passes or not, the requirement for us to advance into a, a city that has uh, districts is forthcoming, you know, no matter what. So we know that that provided this one sort of window for us dive in deeply to make sure that we did our due diligence to bring forward a really comprehensive option. And that's where we landed in terms of what's before you. Um, and it, it didn't go without a lot of serious consideration and thought. And ultimately, this recommendation really puts the decision before our voters to decide ultimately how they want to see the city move forward in regards to having a directly elected mayor in six districts as opposed to seven districts only. So um, I appreciate you, Councilmember Myers, for really further clarifying some of the nuances within the proposal in regards to the duties essentially remaining the same um, and ultimately having uh, somebody who with that broader perspective of the city, but also being an adherence to the um, the, the litigation that's before us as well. So that's um, that's sort of all the comments I have and, and we're prepared and happy to answer any questions as well. Thank you. Council Member Golder. I also wanna thank the staff and my colleagues for all of the work um, that went into bringing this forward and um, just acknowledging that we are moving to districts whether it's six or seven, we hope that that will be for the public to decide. And the idea that came from members of this body and the community that it would be nice to have um, somebody with kind of a global holistic view of the city would be an asset to this group. And so um, I think we have plenty of time for public outreach and what better way for the public to be involved than to you know have it hit the ballot and let people um, really weigh in so yeah thank you everybody thank you council member golder uh i would like to bring it out to uh 
counsel questions at this time. Council member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you to my colleagues and staff for your work on this. I wonder if my colleagues who worked on this or staff could just share a little bit more about thoughts on public outreach and in particular outreach to communities who are harder to reach and outreach to Latinx communities, if you could share the plan and the process of that moving forward. Council member Kalantari Johnson, I think I'm probably in the best position to speak to that. And the council members can also add, we've sort of been a holding pattern while we resolve this because it's already a little bit complicated. We certainly don't want to complicate it anymore. So we were waiting to have this resolved. Before that, before we realized this was an option, we launched, we began to launch our process on the seven district maps and, but didn't really fully implement that. We have, we have surveys, we have interactive mapping tools for people to use to suggest alternatives. And we will do that with the six district maps as well. But we also are very concerned about reaching out to our underserved communities. We have been, we've connected with our city colleagues over at senior center to make sure we're reaching out to seniors. And then Peter Vichier, our community liaison to the Spanish speaking community has been working closely with me in terms of our outreach. We are going to be partnering and doing some in-person events for those who may not be able to have access to online resources that we have. And for those who may not read or we're going to go and do some in-person things. He has been connecting with Barrios Unidos and talked to some of the Mercy housing locations, participate in some of their meetings and, and some other venues like that. And I know you suggested some other opportunities and we're going to, we're going to exhaust those. Thank you. That's really helpful. Council member coming. Thank you, mayor. I want to thank everyone for all the work on into this agenda item. I keep some of my questions short for now. I have comments I'll like to make later, but I do want to reference, you know, the motion that led to the establishment of this committee and a couple of pieces there were turning with the process and timeline for community engagement, consider reestablishing the charter amendment committee. And then I do know that there were other options brought up that mentioned earlier about random choice voting. So I'm just curious about those other parts of this, what was the, of the direction that was provided because the agenda report really only focuses on the six districts at large mayor and doesn't really address some of the other direction that was provided. So I don't know if it's staff or if members of the subcommittee want to speak to that, but wanting to know kind of where those other pieces are at and, you know, why we're not doing all these right now. Do you want to do that or our team? Yeah, there we go. I'm happy to, if it's, you know, if it's helpful, I, I guess what I'll say is we did, we did have those, we had a depth conversation around all the different considerations and ultimately landed on this is the best path right now moving forward. You know, and so, you know, there are so many avenues. There's no one way to do this, right? I think is ultimately where we kind of understood this all to be, right? When you start to sort of blend all the different options and how different configurations of city government can work, they look really different. And so within our discussions, we talked about ranked choice voting, ultimately decided not to pursue that as a recommendation at this time, given the, really the shift before us being quite substantial in regards to our city. Not to say that that couldn't be forthcoming at a future time, as well as some of the other 
points of discussion that were brought up in terms of the original direction. Uh, so, I mean, I guess in summary, that's sort of how I would respond to that question. It wasn't that it didn't go undiscussed, it just meant that this is where we ultimately landed in the recommendation we wanted to bring forward to you all. And I welcome Casey or others who want to. And I want to also say super special shout out to Casey for her hard work and for Cassie. They did a really great job. Thank you. Uh, you want to respond uh, as well, Casey, Mark? Sure, absolutely. Um, I, I just would um, that you know um, this is this is the committee's decision on um, where they want to go as a as a matter of policy, and, and we're trying to facilitate the direction that, that they're given to us. My understanding is that the ranked choice voting is not necessarily off the table, but that, that there was a time sensitivity around this one particular point, and um, so that there was an urgency to moving this to the council to make a decision on whether um, the council would like to act on this, uh, because there's a limitation by March 11th. Um, but, it, you know, we, if, if the committee would like to continue to move forward on that, we are prepared to do on ranked choice voting and the other questions. Uh, we are, we, we, as staff, stand ready to do that. Um, I, I had a quick question and then I'll go to Council Member Brown. Um, you brought up. Can you come back to me maybe because I wasn't done asking. Oh, yes, sorry. I apologize. Let's go back to Council Member Cumming. You can, if you have your question, you can go ahead and ask. I don't want to digress, so we'll stick with you finishing out your question. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, the next question I have for the city attorney just to get some clarification on the resolution going to be adopted. And so maybe it'd be helpful for the public, but um, this is the first time this resolution is coming before us. And I'm just curious if what gets adopted in terms of Exhibit A, if that would be the language that would move forward in terms of how the city would conduct um, kind of this direct left mayor process. So the idea is that, and I guess my concern is that, you know, no one's really, hasn't really had for the public. And I think it has been expressed that there's been some rush around this and so my one of my big that um you know uh, in terms of the roles for example the presiding of the mayor um and issues around terms and limits that some members of the community may have other thoughts on what the role of the mayor should be could we stick with the um, city manager form of government and so you know when people think about um what we're going to be moving toward in terms of the direct left mayor, would this resolution kind of be something that the city council would be moving forward and that would be kind of codified? That would be the option that we have when they're voting on what we'll be moving towards in terms of a direct left. So there's a lot to unpack there, but let me, let me see if I can narrow down the, the focus a bit. So what you have before you is a resolution that would, if approved, go on <clears throat> the ballot for the June election. There's a timing issue here in that the election in June is on June 7th. The county elections official has 30 days to certify the results of the election, which is on July 7th. In order to comply with the statute, the county elections official has to have the district maps by July 6th. There's a chance, not a great chance, but there is a chance that the resolution could be placed on the ballot, an election could occur, a measure could pass, but the election might you know, there's a remote chance that the election won't be certified by July 7th. And when we bring forward an ordinance uh, for the council's consideration uh, for adopting district maps, we have to deal with that uncertainty. 
So what would be brought forward is a resol or an ordinance adopting a six district map and a seven district map in the alternative. If it's clear after June 7th that the measure fails, then the seven district map would go to the voters in November. If the results are known in advance or before the 7th of July and measure passes, then a six district map would go before the voters. And so that is the process that uh, would be followed. And the language that's in front of you in the resolution would amend the city charter to specify elections by district uh, for six council members at large election for the mayor, slightly change the wording of the mayor's duties, but not in a real substantive way. And also it would require uh, after the November 2022 election that both council member and mayoral offices would be subject to a primary or first round election in the primary prior to each city council election in November, whereby if a single candidate garners a simple majority of the vote, that candidate would be elected uh, either in March or June of the election year. Uh, and if no candidate uh, garners a simple majority, then the top two vote getters would be in a runoff election at the November uh, election. That's the process that is currently utilized for district elections uh, for Board of Supervisors. And so we would be basically on a similar pattern as uh, the Board of Supervisors. I think I, that responds to your question, but if there's something I missed, remind me. I think that more or less got to it. So pretty much the language that would be adopted in this resolution would be the language would be what the city, what the community members will be voting on. So right. Should we move in that direction with an at-large mayor? That these would be the roles and That's responsibilities. Right. And outside of approving that language today, I mean, since this is the first time coming to this publicly, there'd be no other opportunity. Unless we extended it on the placement of the measure before the voters, if the council takes action today, sort of putting another item on the agenda to rescind that action or modify that action at the March 8th meeting, those would be the last opportunities because the, the calling of the election has to occur for the June ballot by March 11th, the Friday after your next council meeting. Um, and then, um, one other question I had there's been a lot been brought up around you know moving to seven districts and then having to move back to six districts and a direct elect mayor and one item in the agenda report came up uh says if the election results are not certain as of july 6th city will proceed with seven districts the november 8 2022 election an implementation of the transition to six districts with an at-large mayor could not be implemented until the 24 election cycle and so I guess my question is, it you know, this language indicates that there would be some mechanism for shifting from a six district from seven district back to a six district. Um, um, voter map after um, after the 2022 election. And so I'm just kind of trying to understand, you know, why we can't take the time then to get more community input. If it seems like there is the possibility that we will go to seven districts and then transition back to six districts at a later point in time, the direct one. I think the timing concern is uh, dictated by the elections calendar that's provided for under state law for placing matters on the on the ballot. So that's that's just the reality that we have to deal with. And the scenario that you described is in the very unlikely scenario or situation in which um, the process takes the full 30 days and in the last uh, few days before the certification, it's neck and neck and we don't know for certain uh, whether or not the measure is going to pass. Uh, and in that very unlikely situation, um, 
then there's a remote possibility that there would be a seven district election in November, followed by a redistricting and at large mayor with six districts in 2024. Then um, two last questions. One is around, I've talked to some people and they're interested in understanding what the costs are to the city, because it sounds like, you know, there will be the need to, we've been on this track of creating seven district maps. Now there's going to be the need to create six district maps. Obviously, you know, we've entered into a contract with a specified number of maps that we're going to create. And now we have to amend that. Um, those costs are going to go up. And so we've been asking what those costs um, would be. There is an, an additional expense associated with the preparation of the six district maps, but I don't have that figure. I don't know, Casey. Actually, um, the demographer uh, is prepared to give us six district, three six district maps as part of the existing contract with no additional. Great. Obviously, if there's a two stage election process, then that will be additional costs. For placing the matter on the on the primary ballot. Great, and then I guess my last question is: um, So, are we in, if, if this moves forward, are we anticipating this year that we wouldn't have a runoff for the 2022 election? That they, we would have if, if, if this were to pass, and there's not enough time in June and November, would we then have to have you know some kind of special form of election where? Don't have a runoff, and we just have that one election be for the council members and the mayor. It's a no, or no. The the proposed charter amendment would specify that for the twenty twenty two election year only, the candidate that receives the highest number of votes would uh, would be elected, uh, and then the two round elections would start in twenty twenty four. Thank you. Does that conclude your questions, Council Member Cumming? I have more, but in the sake of time and knowing that there's other people with questions, I'm just going to hold the rest of the questions. So, but those are the some of the main ones I wanted to um, get some information okay. on. Thank, Thank you. you so um, okay, Council Member Brown. Thank you for waiting. No problem. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, actually, uh, quite a few of my questions have been asked and answered, I think. Um, I'm still, as I think through how this is gonna go, I feel entirely clear, but um, thank you for, uh, for those. I have a couple of other questions related to the content of the resolution. Uh, the first one is in the, in part one, this is um, in section one, three so it's a it's not page numbers the page numbers but it's like the top of six um the document attached to our agenda this is there is a consideration for um around eligibility for re-election so as for the public probably without any information not not entirely <laughs> sure what's happening here but the, you know, right now the council, uh, individual council members can run for two consecutive terms and then must take a uh, two year period before the possibility of running again. And um, there are suggested changes in this section uh, and in section D in particular, uh, and these changes would allow for six so four terms consecutive in various considerations again, the general public. Um, and I understand the rationale for uh, number so D and then um, Q. Um, and I what I not so that would for if you're if you're on the council and then you want to run for mayor, you don't have to wait. For mayor. One is on the council and wants to run, doesn't have to wait for the two year hiatus. And or the other way. So if you're met, if one is mayor and wants to run in a district following mayor, that could happen immediately. But part three is um, says a, a council member um, not be prevented from running for a different council seat 
in the event the council member moved. Um, and I am, I'm, I'm not, I'm, that is a piece that I, I just don't understand the logic there. Um, why, it, in the unlikely event, using that, that terminology, in the unlikely event that somebody is so enamored of uh, being a council member that they wanted to continue and not take that break, that they could then move and represent a different district. So I, I guess I am, I'd like to understand why, what the rationale was the committee, I suppose, on why you included that, um, because it, it doesn't, it's kind of counterintuitive if the idea is to have better representation of somebody in your neighborhood, um, that for somebody, if they wanted to continue to represent a council member, they'd have to go represent another neighbor. Um, so just, if I, could, uh, if I could hear more about that, it would be helpful. I have one other question about <laughs> that, but I'll, I'll pass that one. I think that probably is a question for the committee. Um, there was a, a lot of discussion about how we wanted to deal with potential term limits for council members. Uh, the, the initial question was, should a council member elected by district uh, be able to run for mayor position after two terms? And the committee was, um, and I think I think it was unanimously in support of that based on you know, having experience as a council member before running for, for mayor. Um, the, the concept of serving out two terms in one district and moving to another, I think it was just reflected the committee's view that um, in the event a council member moves to a different district that they would have the opportunity to continue to serve. Um, but, um, but that is a policy question for the council. And so that could be changed if that's the direction the council wants to go. Yeah, I, I just like to hear the rationale. The other pieces make sense to me, being able to run for, if, if we go down this road, that all makes sense. There's a rationale in terms of, you know, gov you know governmental institutions and representation that makes sense to me there, but the kind of building in Again, the unlikely potential for uh, carpet bagging in you know across the city just seems it, I don't I, I I don't see the rationale. So I just like to understand that and or ask my colleagues if to be considering that. Is there any um, any council member on the committee that would like to respond to that? I'll let Mark mean I get. Martine, if you want to chime in and yeah, I um I he's uh Tony, I interpreted that as being some consideration for legal purposes, but I could be wrong. I don't necessarily recall adding that component other and I know Cass or Casey is or Cassie is here right now, but in terms of some of the considerations that if for example someone needed to move, that would be right an unlikely scenario, but it could be accommodated. So I, I felt like that was more of a legal terminology as opposed to a committee recommendation and policy. But I asked my colleagues if I just council member Golder. <laughs> I was gonna say the same thing. Like the way I interpret it is that not everyone's gonna live in their neighborhood necessarily for the rest of their life. And it's providing flexibility for people in, in, in particular like people that aren't homeowners necessarily, that if they need to move or want to move and they could represent the new neighborhood that they live in, or um, that was how I interpreted it. But, um, but and I see Sandy wants to say something. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't want to be difficult here. It just, just seems counterintuitive that we would give candidates or elected um, an opportunity to serve six years straight by moving. I understand accommodating will move, but if you move, then you can represent that just for the next time that moves up. Um, so I guess I, whereas don't move, wait, you have to wait. Uh, I, again, it's just, I don't, I understand what you guys are getting at, but I don't think the remedy for that, remedy for um, renters or maybe displaced through, you know, choice or not choice, um, be able to continue to serve is a different question than being able to serve a third and fourth through 
So I, 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 I really just don't to clarify, feels, feels we weird. did not view this as a legal requirement. Um, it really is a policy decision for the for the council. And so uh, council members Watkins and and Golder expressed what I took to be the sentiment of the ad hoc committee when we discussed this this provision. Understood. But again, I'm just so I'm asking my colleagues the question, is that your intention to allow for six for four consecutive terms only if no, that so wasn't our intention. That wasn't mine. <laughs> That's the way it's written, though. So I guess yeah, I, we I can look at something that. that I would like to get resolved before we you know, yeah. put this on the ballot. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for pointing that thanks. out. Yeah, I, I don't mean difficult. It's just... No, no, no. I, really yeah. Confusing. I just, yeah. I mean, I, I, I would like to point out that um, that would be some tricky timing for a council member to serve two full terms and then step into a position because essentially if you relocated out of your district that would be tantamount to abandoning the office and so at that point the office would be vacant you could do that in june of an election year in time to get your name on the ballot for november but the office would be vacant in the meantime so it's kind of tricky uh, how that would play out. Again, just wondering the rationale and given that it's why that's all held up. I, would, I, I might just add that Tony just brought up what I was understanding was that kind of the carpet baggers uh, idea I think would be hard to for someone to do, um, but that the intent I understood the intent actually as it is written, which is that um, that most in most most likely, if someone was moving or they were forced to move, um, you know, we were trying to we we're trying to give that person the opportunity to make sure that if they did have to move into another district, they could still be serving two full. And so the intent is to try to, to protect people who may not be homeowners, um, but that someone who was in a seat uh, would would really it would be kind of unlikely that they would, you know, vacate that seat with the intention of sort of trying to double dip in a way that's different than a council member who's staying in the right. I mean the. Yeah. You know, at the beginning of the sentence says, you know, our our existing charter says that as a as an existing council member, you can serve two two terms consecutive, and then you have to take two years off. And so I think part of the idea was that um, you know, someone who was forced to move that wasn't a homeowner wasn't somehow penalized or lost or is losing the opportunity to do those consecutive. That, I appreciate that, I, and I, I, I really, and you, given the comments I've made throughout this process, I imagine, you know, I, I do really appreciate that. I guess I'm just what confused me is that it, the way it's written, is um, within the exceptions that would allow someone in that the way it's written. It's clear that that is what, and and it is possible. So again, I'm. This is the kind of thing where I feel like potentially partly due to the urgency and quickly turn around, it may not be getting, you know, using language that actually addresses the potential problem, but I do appreciate um, your, your thinking about that and trying to, wanting to do something. Um, so I just, another, just, just, yeah. uh, just really briefly, uh, be part of those conversations, I, I do think the spirit was to just explicitly state that if someone were to move, or had to move, they'd still have the ability to run in a different district. And I think the concern that you're raising, Councilmember uh, Brown, makes a lot of sense. And I think one way to maybe thread the needle on it would be to still require a two year cooling off period after two consecutive terms, regardless of whether or not you're moving from one district to the other, uh, to your point, because it, it is in that exempted area now. That could be an easy change, but uh, we can make it the way. 
change in the language if that's the direction the council wanted to go. And I agree with Tony, it is a policy decision. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that. It's just, yeah, it just maybe some clarifying language to, you know, clarifying language. Uh, another question that I had was related to the duties of the mayor section. Um, and this is the uh, section 604, just a little further down on that same page. Um, and I, I recognize it looks to me like section D is sort of codifying what we have as council policy about uh, items going on to the council agenda um, only when there are three members of the council who are willing to sign on to an item. Um, but so I guess I'm wondering about the rationale for modifying that in our charter for section D and then C, um, this, C, this does seem like the way it's worded does seem like, uh, um, a, a significant change and maybe I'm misreading, but, um, significant change in change in terms of the the authority of the mayor so of the primary but not exclusive responsibility for interpreting the policies programs and needs of city government full and as occasion requires the mayor may inform so in is that really but is that the way we do it that the mayor interprets the policy I guess I, maybe I'm mis maybe this is just about the, the kind of public relations aspect of the of the job and it's not really about policy. I read it more as a communications function than a a, a policy determination. Okay, I, I I'm again just trying to make sure I understand. And I think yeah, Sandy, I can. I mean, I think that um, the intent behind that was to just recognize that role. The you know that, and we discussed whether or not it should go in, um, but because it, the mayor will be at large, um, you know it's important to you know for people to understand sort of because we're moving to districts and they're you know so they're going to be talking to their district council member, which is maybe a very foreign thing for all of us, <laughs> um, but really understanding you know that structure, and so we did think it. Would be important to try to codify harder if I remember correctly. At all. Yeah, that's right. I would just add that it's essentially codifying the presiding officers or duties of the officer who's representing the city and the city council and communications essentially, and um, codifying the opportunity for three council members to also, you know, be able to add to the, the city council agendas. Right, thanks. I'll I'll save my comments on that later. Uh, uh, Council Member Cummington and, and Myers. Council Member Myers. I had another question. Um is it it dawned on me while we were having this conversation. I mean we um a lot easier to make and Actually, Tony, maybe you can weigh in on this. So I'll, I actually have two questions. First one, Tony, if we move forward with seven districts and the ordinance change, is that like, is that something that a future city council will be able to more easily amend in terms of districts and roles, et cetera, versus what we're moving, what we're, we had before us is a six district rep with mayor charter. Um, yeah, yes, um, the, the council could uh, could move forward with the seven districts by ordinance uh, under case law, but um, in order to move forward with the six districts and directly elected mayor, it requires a charter amendment. And a charter amendment, as you know, can only be amended by a subsequent charter amendment, which is required to be presented to the voters and acted upon by the voters in order to take effect. 
Great. Because um, I guess the concern comes from the ability to make changes to a system that we're going to newly adopt. Um, that I haven't go to the voters first. So, you know, being able to provide some time and flexibility around seeing how a new system works versus kind of jumping into districts with the charter amendment. Because um, my follow up question was going to be um, one thing I, that's absent from the charter amendment is what the, the um, representatives who live within their district and then for whatever reason have to find new housing outside of their district. We've seen that happen to city. Since I've been on the city council, we've seen that happen to at least two city council members. I just recently moved as well. Um, yeah, three city council members. So, um, so the idea is that you know if people have to move during their term, what opportunity will they have to either stay in office, or does it mean that if they move outside of their district because they have to move and they can't find housing, does that then force them off? So I think that's something that. Uh, is worth kind of us thinking about and trying to figure out how to solve. So that's a good question. Um, as I read the charter currently, um, members elected to the city council have to be residents of the city. So if a person had to move from their current residence within the city and were unable and is unable to locate a suitable residence alternative within the city, then uh, and then moved outside of the city, then that office becomes vacant upon establishing the new residence outside of the city. And the same rule would apply within the district. So if a council member uh, lived in District 1 and had to relocate to District 6, then that office would become vacant. Uh, and then I have a question for the city manager. And I think it's Fortunate that we have you here since you just came from a, a uh, city that's in district. Um, I know with Board of Supervisors, we have districts as well, obviously. And one thing that I've been aware of is that supervisors don't need, you know, um, two other super, another supervisor to put an item on the uh, agenda, that each supervisor put an item on the board's agenda. And I just wonder because of the fact that. Since we're moving to districts and each district's gonna have unique needs that might not be of interest to other members on the board, whether or not we need to keep flexibility around that so that you know maybe individual council members from their districts can put an item on the agenda. Um, because you know, what happens in the flats might not affect the west side or you know, um, upper the upper west side or the east side. And so being able to, to not restrict Council members from putting items on the agenda. And so I'm just curious whether or not Watsonville, or curious about what the process was in Watsonville in terms of um, council members being able to put items on the agenda since that was a city that operates with district. Uh, sure, Councilmember Cummins. Um, good question. So Watsonville's process, uh, not that dissimilar to what's proposed here, still requires. Um, and provide some significant authority to the mayor uh, setting the agenda. Um, and through an agenda review process, um, allows three council members um, bring an item forward. They're also similar, similar to the structure that would be proposed here. If um, council member was unable to, re unable to, uh, well, two other council members to have that level of support to bring an item forward. A motion can always be made during a regular meeting uh, requesting support to also place an item on the agenda. Um, so there's there's multiple avenues uh, to get there. Thanks. Those are my questions. Uh, thank you. Um, many of my questions have been answered as well. Um, I did want to um, go back to if a council member moved, is there an opportunity to finish out their term or it just automatically comes vacant if they move out of district once we're in district, once we transition to district election? I guess that question might be for Tony Kandati. Yes, I'm, I'm digesting the question. Um, 
the way it's currently written, um, that would not be a possibility. Would it be different for the six or the seven, Tony? That possibility? No, it would not be different. Yeah, I feel like we're confusing a little bit. This, it may be correct me, but Tony, the charter, the charter amendment not detailing the elected council member, whether it's seven, merely the election of an out part. I feel like we're sort of big map. I just want to make sure that's correct. Um, as I'm as I'm looking at this, I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out if there's a way to interpret this as allowing a council member to serve out the term of their office if they vacate the district. Um, but we are including rules in the draft charter amendment that that address um, these issues. And so it, it's not simply the question of dis, a six district with an at large versus seven districts. Um, we have provisions relating to two stage uh, elections, um, what have you. I can come back um, while you look at that. Uh, my other, um, we have we received some questions from the public. I think many of them have been answered. There was some um, um, understanding uh, that the, the, the possibility of six districts and an at-large elected mayor um, would mean a strong mayor form of government. And so what I'm hearing is um, just a clarifying question. That is not the case. It's still a council city manager form of government and there um, would not be a strong mayor. It, the only difference would be in this proposal is that the mayor would be elected by the public rather than appointed by council. And the term would be a four-year term versus what's currently a one-year term. Is that correct? That's right. A strong mayor form of government is a it's a form of government in which the mayor essentially functions as the manager of the city. So that's it's not accurate to say that this proposal includes a strong mayor form of government. Thank you. Um, the other uh, question I just wanted to clarify was the rank choice voting um, uh, question. And my understanding is that an at-large rank choice voting system is not possible at this point, that we are already on track under the settlement to move forward with seven districts, to transition to a seven district election. And what's proposed here is an option that be six districts and an at-large mayor, but either way we're moving to district. And rank choice voting is not an option at this point unless we move to districts and then we have ranked choice voting within districts. But at large ranked choice voting is not an option. Um, yeah, I think I think we have to keep two we have two two uh, different issues that, that you're raising. One is can rank, ranked choice voting be used as a remedy for a violation of the California Voting Rights Act? And and some cities have adopted ranked choice voting systems in lieu of district elections. Uh, and, and I don't know offhand if that is merely a policy pref a preference of those cities or if that was as a result of a CDRA violation allegation. The second is with regard to the settlement agreement and the settlement agreement specifies the options of district elections or uh, or, or seven district elections or six district elections with an at-large mayor. So those were the two options that were addressed in the settlement. Great, thank you. Council Member Brown. Uh, 
Okay, if there is any further questions, if not, I will take it out public. Okay, thank you. <laughs> If you are interested in commenting on resolution ordering on the ballot for the June 7th, 2022 primary election, a proposed charter amendment creating six districts and an at-large directly elected mayor, you can raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or by selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. When it's your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set for three minutes. And I will go out to our And I have the first hand raised is I am watching you. Go ahead and you can. Yeah, hi. Uh, I agree with many of the basics of this resolution, uh, but I have some comments. My reading of California law concerning elective mayor's ballot measures, section 39900, seems to indicate the question whether the voters prefer a two or four year term for mayor may also be presented, to which I ask, why not include that question? Why should you decide? There's no downside to the public being able to remove a bad mayor sooner than four years. Also, since a staggered district election idea is not specifically included here, I assume all six districts and the mayor will be elected at once every four years starting in 2022, which I don't really like. Uh, there is a serious question of the wisdom of possibly turning over all representation of every district at once, or even whether having the entire council and mayor being beyond the reach of the people for four years is really the best idea. I favor a staggered election cycle, whatever the questions are as to how fairly to begin such a staggered process. I'm sure this can be fairly done as uh, this voting for all six at once idea, uh, perhaps by having three district terms initially for two year terms chosen at random or perhaps by the fewest votes gathered. I suspect it would take two election cycles to get this completed, but it is not too complicated and it has real advantages of continuity and more frequent public oversight of the council makeup. The entire thrust of the mayor section nowhere seems to indicate my preference that a mayor's duty is to provide leadership to obtain what is the pervasive will of the people for city service and wants that they are willing to pay for, limited by the authority granted by law. Instead, the mayor reads somewhat like an authoritarian, inform the public of the government's needs and inform them as to changes in programs and policies take role possibly unilaterally. This thrust language seems backward to my sense of government. During the recent COVID mandate fascism going on in Canada and in the USA, recognition of uh, who the government mayor council work for are in service to and purpose more welcome. Uh, I suppose I'd vote no at this point with this as is. Lastly, the existing section uh, 604A Mayor being recognized by the governor for purposes of military law sounds very Orwellian to me, and I don't know what that means. I'm curious. Okay. Thank you for calling in. Our next caller is phone number ending in 1705. Thank you. Can you Thank you for taking my comment. Can you hear me? Yes, Ken, welcome. Great. Um, so there is a lot of uh, misunderstanding of the public. I read the public comment letters. This is Eric Rupp. And i um, glad you were able to clear up the relation with uh, an at-large mayor versus strong mayor. Another um, misunderstanding, I believe, is that public it's the vote on this district election. There's a specific section, government section code 34886 that provides for council to adopt district elections in the Cure of California Voting Rights Act issue. And um, I believe that's what you're doing. So some of the letter writers have said that we should be voting on whether or not to have seven district, then I don't believe that that's required to be set by ordinance. 
And uh, so these letter writers think that this move is some nefarious power play, but they're misunderstanding the actual content and direction of counsel. And so I'm glad that we were able to have a discussion and clear most of that up already, but I wanted to add that that one that some of the letter writers had said, suggesting that we needed to vote on this any district any move to district elections as part of a charter amendment was known. And if um the attorney wanted to further clarify that, that might be helpful to the public. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for calling in. And are there any other members of the public that wish to comment on this item? Now is the time to raise your hand and uh, comment on this item. I have caller ending in 8575. Go ahead and there we go. Yes, hello. This is Glenn Schaller. Um, I have been involved politics in mid-70s, and I don't think I have ever seen as poorly handled as I was tonight. Um, we are moving toward just like we're doing so because of a loss. We're setting up seven districts, what we had since the late 40s. We moved to a separately elected mayor. I do believe the power grab. I think it's um, a few folks would like to ensure that they may have the opportunity to serve, even if they are currently living where they are not going to be able to run soon. Um, I'm really hoping that you all decide not to put this on the ballot, not to complicate the process in toward November, and that we can allow the public to get to the idea that every year is some people voting for city council and some will not, and they'll have a chance to do so when it's their turn. I work. Honorary Bay Central Labor Council. I work within the 16 cities and counties, some with districts, some um, that do not. And what I find is council members, council candidates can um, speak directly to their neighbors and the entire city are the folks who often get elected by leadership. Also, I do not want to change the process of people taking turns to being mayor. I think it's been a healthy process whereby um, folks find out what they're good at, work hard, and we have a number of examples of that on this now. Thank you for your time, and I hope you do not put this on the ballot. Thank you for calling in. Um, are there any other members of the public that would like to um, say anything about this item? Uh, now is the time to raise your hand. I have PC Fire. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you, Mayor Bruner and, and Council. <clears throat> this is a, a challenging issue where you decide how the future lies as a city council member. Or I've been working in uh, politics in. In Washington, D.C., the state of Nevada, Colorado, California, I found that when you have a strong mayor and a city council, the energy level of the dialogue becomes more powerful for the city. And I can speak for a number of cities that have that type of relationship. Obviously, some people will think that it's called a power grab. Uh, but one, you've been forced by a lawsuit to do a change. Number two, you're under a dictate to do it by November. Number three, you have options laid on the table. And I think there's a strong preference to have uh, a directly elected mayor. There's a lot of moving parts on this. One of my thought was uh, interesting is that the council member Brown brought up is, you know, if you have to move and you move in another um, move and then uh, then um, be able to run for another office in another, another district, well, that's problematic work with the number of cities in the southern part of the state that were sued and that they changed the district elections. And I think one of the best options was to have it a, a flexible two-year cycle and let the mayor be elected for four years. Then you limit the term limits as you have been on the uh, charter that has been presented. Uh, there's no easy solution here, but I think the, the best solution is to bring it to the vote of the people and give them the opportunity. 
Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for calling in. Our next caller has a phone number ending in 5542. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Press star six, unmute yourself. Caller ending in 5542, are you able to unmute yourself? Either, there we go. Unmute on your device, or star six, there you go. Hi there, welcome. Uh, good day, Mayor and Council Members on 2220222. District election desk proposed a straight too much. District election plan from long ago approved by Council was to have seven Council and be approved by ordinance. Now before you today is placing a vote on the June 26th second this year ballot to approve six districts and one at large and a directly elected mayor. One step forward, one step back. Change to district elections must have voter approval according to the city charter. That's one step forward. Council public discussion must have seven districts, period. There's been no extensive public discourse about the direct election of a mayor. Changing our government is critical import to everyone. How does an elect mayor put turn to manage a form of government? We discussed a little of that, but a whole lot more needs public discussion. And today's vote no way allows for this discussion, many other, other complex. The June vote is only be to approve or not approve seven electoral. Why the proposed council district and one at large now? Because John Myers wants to be elected as mayor, putting her self-interest above the public interest in discourse. Committee with Donna Myers, political allies, Boulder, and Watkins apparently created a rigged process. The end result, have a proposal for an elected mayor as a foregoing Council is compelled to proceed to support this district and one at large. Place language to assure that the current Council members be prevented from running for mayor for, say, at least four years after leaving office. This would assure the apparent current power play not occur. One step at a time, ask the electorate if they want district elections with seven districts, period. Then once this is approved or rejected, hold public hearings about a direct election of mayor and the other issues that have been raised. If strong sentiment exists, place a ballot measure have a form of government, and that would be the path for us. I appreciate your time and thoughtful consideration. Have a good day. Thank you for your comment. Our next caller is phone number ending in 6355. Hello. Hi, um, Mayor Bruner and council members. This is Ann Simonton, and uh, this has this is a big change for our city. This is something that we des desperately need to have much more discussion about. For example, Tony Kandati brought up the fact that we could use ranked choice voting in lieu of district elections. I, I mean, that's unclear to me. There's so many things. This is a very big change for our city. It's in imperative that we not do it in June. That's a very Few people, I've lived in this community for a long time, few people show up for the June election. It should be on November at very earliest. And it, we need a lot more discussion about these, about the details, what are the options, what can we do, what, how is this going to work out. We live in a city where 60% of the inhabitants 
are renters. You, you, you are saying that then also you won't change the city charter to say that if someone is elected in a district and then they have to move out of that district. Tony Condotti said if they move out of the city, that's good. But what if they even had to move to a different part of the district? That also should be something that the community should have the time to discuss and talk about the implications of a landlord having the right to throw somebody out that is a duly elected official. There's just so much for this, and I really hope you vote no on this because this needs a lot more town hall, community discussion, and understanding by the citizens of this city. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your time and your comment. Let's see, are there any other attendees uh, that would like to do item number 14 on today's agenda? The resolution ordering on the ballot for the June 7th, 2020. 22 primary election, a proposed charter amendment creating six districts in an at large directly elected term. Okay. It looks like no more public comment on this item. I will bring it back to council. Um, so I'll bring it back for deliberation and a motion. And let's go back to council. I see council member Myers. Up here, stand up. Thank you, Mayor. I was going to go ahead and make a motion um, adopting the resolution, placing on the ballot the seventh primary election, a proposed charter amendment to the 80s. At large mayor. Um, I would like to know if there's language that there are legal folks or manager to offer for the um, I think Council Member Brown good points and like the if there's any any language that we might get. Is that I guess the, the question that I, I would have for the council is what specifically you would like to um, do if if the intent is to make the council member ineligible to run for office after two full terms, uh, even if it's for a different district, then we can write it that way. I'll look at my colleagues. Repeat that again, Tony. I think I'm happy to kind of weigh in on yeah. what I think is the intent, Tony. If, if I can, if I can help clarify, but essentially what I understood the intent to be was that we don't want to discourage any council members who want to pursue mayor and who have experience, you know, from their council time pursue mayor. So that was the intent around allowing them to then run for mayor. But in terms of the between districts, I think Matt, you had some suggested cleanup language around how to kind of reconcile that, which wasn't sort of our hope to have people sort of move around to run. The intent was really trying to encourage people who have experience to want to serve, but not beyond the 16 years. Right. Uh... Councilmember Watkins. So the concern that I heard um, Council's discussion earlier was not having uh, the two-term limitation or, or prohibition apply to those that may be moving from one district to the next. So what I might suggest is just striking uh, that subsection uh, three in that paragraph, that section, and including a statement, and Tony can word this better than I could, but including a statement um, in that first sentence, that just also makes clear that that is also including council members who may move on council. So again, exp making explicitly clear that um, regardless of whether you're moving or not, you can't be on council more than two consecutive. Not including 
does let me run. Wanting to make that clear. I think that was uh, a question. And that is what uh, currently is in our charter is the two consecutive terms and then two years um, where after two years you turn run again. So are, is that the intent to kind of carry that through with the same similar intent and language? Yes. Any? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think yeah, I think that that strike through suggestion is maybe we can put that mark up. So that is my motion. I am working on that right now, and I should have it up on your screen in a minute. Is there um, a second or to the motion, um, Vice Mayor Watkins? You had your hand up. Yeah, I'm happy to second the motion, and um, just we'll make a few brief comments in that. You know, I, I will speak, I think, on behalf of myself, and I think I can fairly speak on behalf of my colleagues who really, you know, put a lot of thought and effort into trying to bring forward a proposal before our, our council, but ultimately before our voters, given the unique circumstances that are before us in regards to the litigation that is impending and requiring us to um, districts. So I, I, um, I also want to say if folks who, you know, don't feel the need to have directly elected mayor are not supportive of this charter amendment. If if they feel strongly about that, then they should vote no. And I and that we and we want to hear from our community. We want to hear from our voters and we want them to help us what what form of government they'd like to see move forward for an you know for a long period of time. So it was really around doing our due diligence, knowing that we're in this sort of really unique time kind of of massive transition to really look at all options and to look at what I've heard and what I think a number of people have heard is wanting to explore this option. And so the option is, what we're asking really our council to do is just to put this before the voters and have them weigh in on what direction they'd like to see this transition take. And if overwhelmingly they decide that they don't want to see a directly elected mayor, then no matter what, we'll be transitioning to the seven districts. But we didn't want to pass up the opportunity to ask them this question and so I just wanted to sort of provide that context that this is really about us doing our due diligence as our as elected representatives of our community for our city um, without any kind of pers personal or um, kind of political angle around individual needs. This is truly about the governance of our community and putting before our voters what they'd like to ask. So I just sort of wanted to add that context um, for our community and for our council in regards to how we landed in place. Um, that being said, I'm happy to you know continue to second the motion. I appreciate the cleanup language in regards to the considerations around the term limits and the transitions and maintaining the same particularly for the districts. Um, and um, yeah, happy to move forward with with what we have before us. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins, um, Council Member Cummings, and then Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. And I just do want to give, um, recognize the work that's done on this by the other council members and mm -hmm. staff. And I think we can all agree that this is a major shift to our democracy. Um, it's not, not just the district election shift, but this idea that we would shift to a directly elected mayor. And personally, um, I believe that what I've heard from many members of the public is that the public should have ample opportunity to weigh in on this major decision that we're going to be putting forward and that we were going to be putting on our ballot. Um, there was a there was ample time and opportunity for us to have these discussions. Uh, we last year uh, this came up at the city council for the city council and where we were discussing essentially looking at um, ranked choice voting at large mayor. And I think we all reached consensus on the fact that having these meetings with the community about shifting to districts then having a direct elect mayor possibly ranked choice voting was a lot for us to expect the community to take in all at one time uh, which is why we continue to move down this path of focusing on the seven districts which is in and of itself a major shift that maybe not many uh, members of the public want to move forward with and um, you know, I believe that if we want to move forward with a direct elect mayor 
personally, I'd really like to hear what, what the community wants to see because um, we've already heard today uh, some options around whether the mayor's years or four years. Um, I think there are issues around compensation. You're muted. I heard um, there are issues around compensation and then you cut off. Yeah, and I don't know how that happened because I wasn't touching my mouse, but okay. Continue. Um, there are issues around uh, compensation, number of years someone can serve as mayor, and I think that's a, a valid point to bring up. And then also, you know, think about equity in our community, shifting to a directly elected mayor versus having someone who rotates, um, you know, could actually have a lot of impacts on having a diverse uh, voices serve in the role of mayor. So, for example, um, if you have a rotating mayor, there's opportunities for people who may represent flats versus the side, west side, have a chance of being mayor. And, you know, one of the things that see from these levels of office is that um, you know it takes a lot of time to run and having to raise a lot of money uh, could actually train I can see um, representing us as mayor moving forward. I think that um, that also was something I was going to bring up around the 50% um, plus one and runoff elections um, of having a longer time period of when someone is running potentially also really negative impacts Low income and working class people, because I think having us having all of us have run for office before, you know, even if you start in July or August during the normal filing deadlines, the run from August to November is a pretty substantial amount of time. And if this now turns into you having to run for almost an entire year, that can have serious negative impacts on who is um, going to be you know, able to run for those seats. Because we, can, we know that low income people. Can't take off that much time work, work and working class either, and, um, and that also gets to this idea of compensation. If we're keeping the mayor's compensation at well, it's roughly forty thousand dollars a year, um, we won't see as many people from lower income communities want to step up to those roles. And so, I think that this is something that people have been asking about in terms of having a discussion. And so, um, I'm proposing a substitute motion, uh, which I've sent to Bahrain, and it would be to turn with a process timeline for community engagement to explore charter amendments related to topics, including but not limited to directly like the mayor, district composition, mayor and council member compensation, strong mayor versus strong city manager form of government, mayor term length, rate choice voting, among other options. Um, you know, similar to where we're at right now, if there were, you know, if we moved to seven districts and it turns out that many members of the community want to see us move to direct like mayor and six districts, that could be a 5-2 vote, a 4-3 vote, it could be a 7-0 vote in favor, or we could have opposition. But um, I feel that you know, what we've been hearing is that a lot of people haven't heard about the direction we're moving in right now. This is the first time any of this language is coming forward to the community. And given the impacts this will have on our democracy, it makes the most sense that we try to get the most what is possible um, before making uh, such a drastic change. And then I guess the one thing I'll end with as well is um, I'm totally in favor of having the community uh, weigh in on these types of decisions via putting an item on the ballot. However, similar to the revenue measure, um, I think it's really important that we're doing our homework first to see if this is something that we really need on the ballot. With the revenue measure, we conduct polls. And what I've heard since I've been on the council is when council goes to put items on the ballot, while this hasn't always been the case, that they often try to do a poll to get a sense of the, from the community of what the community wants to do and where they want to go. And this seems like a decision that we're going to be making and putting before the voters that really would benefit us from us putting something out into the community first, getting a sense of what does the community want um, in terms of we're going to move forward with the direct like what that role would be and, and what I've been saying before. So, um, and if that's not the case, I would imagine there are a number of ballot measures that we could move forward that we'd be interested in seeing 
um, whether that be you know, um, real estate transfer tax or other types of items that express interest in, but we really want to make sure that we do our homework first. So I think that if we're going to move forward with this, um, it would make the most sense just to take our time, get community input, and, and see where the community is. So I'll leave my comments there, and thank you all for your hard work and time on this issue. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Um, we have a new substitute motion on the floor. Um, is there a second? Yeah, I'll second that. And I do have some comments as well. Okay, go ahead, if Council whenever. Member Brown. We have a first and a second. Hi, Brown. Thank you. Um, so I just want to make a, a few comments here about um, my, my, my feeling about the proposal or the agenda item as it was presented to us um, and, and my, my reasoning in supporting a substitute motion here. Um, some of this has already been said by Mr. Cummings, I'll try not to be repetitive, but there are a few things I think maybe do bear repeating. Um, so, We've been at this, we've been having this conversation about the move to district elections. And yet the general public is largely unaware of what's going on. Um, the, I anecdotally, um, and others heard, yes, you're hearing from people anecdotally, this is a great idea. I have anecdotally had uh, many, many people call and email me, reach out to me since our agenda was published Thing, what in the world is going on, like coming out of nowhere, you know, has anybody, ha has the public had any chance to um, weigh in? And, um, which I say no, it was new to me as well, relatively new. Um, the limited opportunities that we've had for public discussion um, in around seven districts, there's been no extensive public discourse about the election of an at-large mayor. Um, the, and, and uh, you know, I'll just say, um, throughout the process, I've expressed my dismay about the way this decision uh, who district elections has been forced upon us, so I won't repeat all of that, but incredible loss. And until today, I've been discussing making that transition without going out to the voters. Um, we have been consistently advised that that is the smoothest way forward to address um, the potential claim and what was agreed to in the settlement agreement. Um, not going to the voters, we don't need to do that under CRA, which trumps the charter. Um, so, you know, I've been, and I believe that we were all, um, However, um, you know, uh, uncomfortably or, you know, um, yeah, uncomfortably uh, moving through that process, um, hearing and responding to that, that recommendation, that advice way. And now here we are with a proposal that is very different. Um, and, We've also been told that district elections will be forthcoming no matter what. Um, yeah, I mean, it may, that's true, I suppose, but you know, it, that's really the result of choices that have been made by the council, by majority members of councils, now three iterations of this um, over the past two years that have been made. And those have been made largely behind closed doors. Um, we have not had this conversation out in the public. We finally, over the course of the past, uh, last fall have started talking about it. Um, I don't believe we've, um, I believe there's a lot more work. Um, this isn't, this isn't a matter of me supporting or opposing this particular proposal and the idea of an at-large mayor if we're going to move this reflection. I don't know. I don't. I'm a member of this council who has been following this pretty carefully and closely, and I don't know. <laughs> and so I think that tells, I mean, that tells me something about um, what, you know, what that looks like 
put a question before the voter. Um, I agree that you know the voter. It is important to put this before the voters, and um, so not supporting moving forward in the way that was proposed to us today, prior to a, a substitute motion. Um, you know, that's it's it. Well, I guess I'll just I'll, I'll just take a step back. I'm gonna because I, I, I don't want to go on and on about this, but you know I just want to say, you know, it's. It's a proposal that has been um, pretty hastily put together. Um, there, you know, I, I'm just going to highlight the fact that we have had all this time to contemplating this and you know, moving in this direction. Not nobody on this council came forward and said, "Want to look?" So it's not about six or seven. It's about the process by which. Um, it's a fundamental change to our democracy, our system of representation. And if we want it to stand up over time, and I believe you all when you say that that's what we're looking for, um, it deserves more than a, a rush discussion and a resolution that I believe has been basically written with you know, you know, no, all respect to our staff and everybody who and council members who have been working to try to figure out how to navigate this very difficult terrain that is largely been imposed upon us um but it, it, it we have we don't ha we haven't had time and um you know i think if we're we're going to talk about a charter change then we should be we should pro we should open up that conversation have this case happen because this is one very specific type of charter change and none of the others have been kind of really talked about at least now, with your committee, I understand we've had that conversation, but it hasn't happened in a way that's kind of legible or apparent to the center of the public and or to other members of the council until today. Um, I don't say this to um, guess that I'm, you know, I, I want to criticize your work or your intention, but this is a major, and you know, I, I think that we owe it to ourselves and we owe it to the public. To think it through before we put something on the ballot that is much more complex, um, has many, many potential unintended consequences, or and intended consequences that we may not you know, all be all understand. Um, I I just think that we take so. Um, I guess I'll there. Uh, so th that's my rationale. This isn't about me whether or not I support the that large mayor is about um, you know, the context in which we're making that decision it's, that it's been brought to us. Mayor, you're, you're good. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would like to thank uh, my city council colleagues and, and staff colleagues for all your work on this and callers and who have written and called. Um, you know, I think I'll keep my comments pretty brief. Um, we as a council agreed to this ad hoc committee last year. We formed this ad hoc committee to explore this very issue of um, an at-large fair and security. And, and that's what you've done. Put a lot of work into it and um, you've to me, the presentation that we saw earlier, you've done your homework and you've done your due diligence. Um, this, so this isn't new to me. And um, it's not new to some of the constituents that have reached out to me and called me and written me letters and emails. Um, I'd like to hear from the community and I think putting it on the ballot is the ultimate democratic process, a way for us to hear from the community. Um, it's clear from what I heard, staff and legal people that we have a timing issue. That's unfortunate, but it's clear that that's the reality that we find ourselves in. Um, and it's also clear from some of the questions I asked and others asked that that staff is like has a outreach process ready to go, sort of shovel ready, but have been waiting for us to be able to bring this to the public in this format. Um, so, so. Um, those are my sentiments. I think putting it before the voters 
um, is is important. I think if we do it twice now and then again in 2024, it becomes more negatively impactful and more difficult for voters. So I think the best way to engage is to um, work hard in the next several months, engage voters, and let the voters decide. So thanks everyone for your work. Thank you, Kellen, uh, Council Member Kellen Terry Johnson. Um, <clears throat> and I think you know a lot of the points that were made are really important in us determining a path forward. Um, it, this is new to me as well as a as a new newer council member. Some of these decisions were made prior to joining our city council. But one thing has been clear is that we we are moving. We have adopted, a, we are in settlement agreement to move forward with seven districts. So that's not a question at this point. Um, and that does not need to go on a June ballot to move to seven districts. So I wanted to just say that November, um, we will be moving to seven districts. I think what we brought up based on the settlement agreement, there was another option under that settlement agreement. And that was that we could also choose to go to six districts uh, at large mayor. And so that question um, for us to make would require a charter change. Seven districts do not require a charter. Six does. And so that's why that would go to public in the June ballot. Why the June ballot? Because it has to be before our, our settlement agreement deadline in November. And so if we wait till November, we, we can't ask that question unless we go to seven districts. And then in a future couple of years, change harder at that point, which might mean and would most likely mean changing the map, changing the districts then. And so um, it's so much information to absorb and to learn. And there were a lot of clarifying points today, I think. Um, uh, the 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 big thing is uh, letting the this item is not us as a council deciding that there's going to be six there. That's not what's before us. It's us saying, hey, let's put it on the ballot and let the voters decide. If they want to keep seven districts or A or B, seven districts or districts with an at-large mayor and um, so I think over the next two months if, if we move forward in that direction the next two months before the June 7th elect, uh, election um, will need to be a lot of public and, and out and um, I'm glad uh, council member Helen Terry Johnson you asked some of those questions that I had also asked um, earlier about outreach, what, where, where is that outreach? In person, online, um, at events, at residences. Um, what does that look like? What other language? How are we reaching people? What demographic? To make sure there are small group stakeholders, for example. The, the public is clear on the two options that are before us. Um, and I think that, you know, having, having that item on the, the June ballot will help determine, uh, and again, Casey Humard, correct me if I'm wrong, you said there's already strict maps of the demographer. Was we are on? If you all vote to move forward with this, we are prepared to release the six district map. We have three drafts. Okay. So there's currently 
she drafts is seven districts. And that's what we're moving forward. But before before we head there, this is an option to um, really let the voters decide before it gets too tricky later on changing. Let's determine our district now and move forward rather than go to seven districts and then decide if we're going to do it or not later. Um, so can we, uh, thank you for all the work, but can we see that there's a substitute motion? Can we, yes. Can, um, I have some alternative language for the resolution, but I think you should proceed to vote on whether to accept the substitute motion first. Thank you. So the substitute motion to return with a process and timeline for community engagement for charter amendments related to topics, including but not limited to directly elected mayor, district composition, mayor and council member compensation, strong mayor versus strong city manager form of government, mayor term length, and rank voting, among others. Okay, so is, um, we have a first, this is a motion by council member Cummings and a second by council member Brown. And so, um, so this, the, the, you have to, Vote to decide whether to accept the substitute motion, and then if you uh, vote to accept it, then you substitute. Then you can proceed to voting on the language. Of the so I'm going to ask the city clerk for a roll call vote. Member Kalantari Johnson, no. Sir, no. Coming. Aye. Brown? Aye. Meyer? To vote no, but I do just want to record. I recognize that many of the things in this motion are things that still be continued to work as we uh, basically for collection, but for the motion. Um, mainly for the reason of, of we are going to district provide a very clear sense of community and worth gaining. Okay, I'll be um, many of these things are that just as they make this. I appreciate the motion. No. Thanks, Mayor Watkins. No. Mayor Brunner. No, and also for reasons Mayor Myers brought up, um, this is part of the engagement that will happen regardless and the future work that for us. Um, so thank you for bringing up those items at this point. I'm going to move over now back to our original motion. And if we could come back to that motion. Is there a written version or the maker of the motion read that motion? He was the motion was simply to adopt the resolution as presented with a modification to subsection D of section 601, I believe. And I'll share the link with Thank you, you at this point. Thank you. Me really quick at this section 601. I believe so. Yes, it's 601 subsection D. We just lost the motion. This is the alternative there, language. Sorry. There we go. Uh, so, no member of the council shall be eligible for re election or for election to a different council district 
two years, i.e. one general election cycle after the expiration of the second consecutive full term of the office for which the However, this prohibition shall not bar one, a council member elected by district from running for mayor immediately after two terms as a council member, or two, the mayor from running as a by district council member immediately after two terms as mayor. With that said, in no event may any person serve on the council as either a council member or the mayor for more than 16 executive. I accept that change. Does the seconder of the motion accept that change? I do. And I just, I have one brief comment. If, if this would be a good time where I could do that later. As well. We can do that now. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. And I just, I just want to thank and acknowledge my colleagues for this robust session. I think it was, um, it was very insightful. And the reality is, I don't think there is one one way to do it completely perfect in anybody's eyes, right? And there are so many iterations of what this could look like, whether two to four years, whether it be not to have consecutive terms or to others, or and the timing isn't ideal, and I acknowledge that as well. And given the considerations and the time constraint that we're under in regards to the seven districts, that's where we are. I appreciate where Councilmember Myers really highlighted that a number of the things in the in the prior motion really are priorities for exploration as we move forward. Um, and just want to kind of thank our council for robust and it's part of how it goes, right? And so I appreciate all of the thought and all of the input that was provided. I understand it's imperfect and I don't know if there is a perfect here. So it's just sort of holding a both and of that, kind of understanding that. And ultimately it's an option of our city to do as best we can outreach to every member of our community about what is before them so that they can go into the election understanding what they're and and to hear from them is the ultimate form of democracy which i really appreciate that process so i just wanted to acknowledge and thank my colleagues for this discussion and i too as seconder you know approve of the of the modified language and i appreciate councilman brown bringing that up for clarification thank you vice mayor Watson. Okay, um, so now we'll do a roll call vote on this motion. And I'd like to ask the speaker to roll call vote. Mayor, Council Member Commentary Johnson? Aye. Holder? Aye. Aye. No, and I'll say for the record, that um, part of the direction that was why I was supporting this back in November was that um, I'd made a friendly amendment to the term process and timeline the engagement, which was agreed upon and we all voted on um, not have timeline and process around not the community and having this. So I don't have a strong leaning in either direction or vote recollect mayor or rotating mayor. Um, but I do think the process is very important when we're making these major decisions about the shift in our democracy. So um, given that the community hasn't had a good opportunity to weigh in and up until last Thursday did not have a copy of the proposed language um, for both the elect, elect mayor and the ballot language, um, I don't think that we've had very good I'm not voting in favor of it this time, but that doesn't mean I'm opposed to having at large mayor or uh, rotating. Brown? Uh, no, and I, the record, would just reiterate that this is really about um, process for me. And um, so I'll just, I'll leave it. No. Myers? Yeah, Myers? I, I do want to state for the record, um, was and also a caller tonight who um, indicated that this done so I could run for elected mayor. I will publicly state right now, I am not running for mayor. So there's no intent behind this, except the recognition that 
uh, having multiple election periods and cycles where we are going back and asking the voters for different will cause a lot of and actually I think will disincentivize from running. Um, I you know want to echo the, the mayor's comments that we are moving this um, despite you know, the work of the committee and trying to also look at the process, we decided the most important process to always go to your voters. Okay, that is ultimate. That is the ultimate way that we should that bring the. So um, I appreciate the work of my colleague, and uh, I know this is very hard, very very hard. Um, I do think going to the voters is a very important question now. Very important. So I appreciate it. Comments though, and voters say, um, so I'm an I. Hi, Mayor Watkins. Hi. Mayor Bruno. Hi. That motion passes 5 2. And um, I would like to ask um, our city staff for um, an engagement timeline and that process, um, when we can have that information and how we can be involved to help share that information in that process. Mayor Bruner, we, now that we have direction we will be finalizing all those details we will post a lot of this on our district elections page and we will share it with the council and beg of you to share it we want we want the information out and we want this to be successful we want the outreach to be successful i think it would also thank you casey it would also be helpful to know what the full engagement plan is and um how we can participate in in all of the aspects of it whether it's in person, whether it's um, online, whether you know it's small stakeholder groups, whether yeah. it's phone calls, I think you know we're all in in making sure that this process that we can all be successful and making sure the public is informed for making a decision. Absolutely, uh, we will we will keep you all uh, involved and engaged in this. So. Thank you so much. Do you have anything else to add? Um, City Manager Matt Hufficker, you, you almost looked like you were about to. I was thinking about it, Mayor Werner. Um, I just wanted, I want to echo comments that we are eager to ro start this robust process. Staff to put, put together a very thoughtful approach that will meet our community members where they are, uh, including our community. So, um, and, and working with Elizabeth Smith on our team as well, we plan on putting out a press release uh, with those details. And I can certainly, in my next uh, update to the council, provide more details. Uh, and in the interim, get the timeline, places, um, and approach out to the council to move into this work. And today's decision by the council is very helpful, allowing us to. Hey, thank you so much. Uh, let's see, I saw two hands go up. Councilmember Cummings and then Councilmember Brown. I had a question for the staff, which is some of the comments that were made, um, we were making deliberations, we were mentioning that, um, you know, there already is a process and timeline for a number of topics that were up in my motion to come back. So I'm wondering when we should expect to see that come back as well an update on that because a number of those related to um, ranked choice voting, the charter amendment committee, all sorts of other options. And since it sounded like previous direction had been given on that, which is why um, that motion wasn't accepted, then I think it would be good if we get a sense of when we're going to be having those conversations in the process. Finally, we'll be established by the I uh, I think that uh, I appreciate that council member coming. Um, I think that the sense of urgency from the committee on this 
sort of deferred the considerations and everything else. I did have a uh, work plan drafted for their consideration, which they have not had a chance to review yet because, because of the timeliness of this one particular thing. Uh, we, I think that we will bring that to the committee for their direction on next steps. Uh, committee members, uh, you may want to weigh in on that too, but that, that's my thought. I would just add, uh, Council Member Cummings, a number of questions and vision points that were included in your motion that we need to come to ground. Um, I don't know that Casey's work plan was inclusive of all the items that were shared, but that's certainly a discussion we can have with the subcommittee. With the, with the expectation being uh, the committee was tasked with core responsibilities and what we fully covered today, well, some decisions that uh, thoroughly reviewed. Um, in a timeline, that, that, that'll be work. Um, we can yeah, I just, I guess one point I'll make to though is, you know, if there's, I feel like some of these decisions definitely need to input of the community. It shouldn't be just solely made by the subcommittee. So, you know, it'd be good to hear about what should come back and when, and then how it would further engage the community in those directions. All in my comments there, but I'm mainly saying this too because um, there's a lot of feelings of mistrust around people in the community with what the council says it's going to do versus what ends up happening. And I just don't want to see us, you know, going back into a situation where we have more division in the community and less trust with our local. Thank you, Council Member Cummings, for your comments. Uh, Council Member Brown, did you still want to, or you took your hand down? Thanks, Mayor. My question was about, you know, all the rest of it, but, you know, yeah. where's that going to go? Okay. <laughs> and, and will we ever hear about it again? So, yeah, thanks. Thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Watkins? I just wanted to offer that if there are individuals that some of my colleagues do want to refer to the committee or to the staff that had, you know, concerns, to please feel free to do that, that we do want to hear from everybody. And so, if there are specific people that you're hearing from that we're not hearing from, please our way as we start to explore some of these other. Thank you, Vice Mayor Watkins. Okay. Thank you so much, Casey, for joining us today. Thank you very much. I've... Oh, you froze up. Uh, okay, well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to call a five minute break and then we will return with agenda item number 15, which is a presentation on the results from the National Community Survey. So we'll return here at 535. Thank you so much. Everyone a chance back. Online, turn your cameras on. So Someone is not muted and um, wondering if the spark is ready. Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, all right. So um, that was a quick break. Thank you. We are now continuing with our next agenda item number 15, which is a presentation. And I just wanted to make sure Normally, we um, have presentations at the beginning of our meeting, and I've been scheduling uh, presentations to start our meeting off. And um, in this situation, our presenter was unable to attend at the beginning of the meeting. So we were able to schedule this for the end of the meeting. 
instead. So I really um, tried to be flexible. Thank you, Jade Arocha, Director of Survey Research, Polco. And thank you for joining us today and our Communications Director, Elizabeth Smith. This is a presentation item on the results of National Community Survey. The order will be a presentation of the item by Jade Arocha and followed by questions from Council. Since this item is only intended to provide Council with information, we will not be taking public comment on this item. So go ahead, welcome Jade. Thank you for being here and thanks for being flexible with the time. Yes, thank you so much for having me, and I appreciate your flexibility as well uh, with different time zones. And um, yeah, so I'm really happy to be here. Um, I'd love to actually, I'm sorry, Jade. I'm sorry, Jade. I just wanted to say a couple things before you got started. Yes, please. Um, thank you. Um, my name is Elizabeth Smith. I'm the communications manager for the city. Um, we initiated this process with Polco um, uh, to do the national community survey as a benchmark for the city. We haven't ever done anything like this before. We've done polls on specific issues, but not a broad range of quality of life um, issues and investigation. Um, uh, we really wanted to take the temperature of the community on a regular basis. And so we'll be doing this survey every two years. Um, it's a reliable set of data points that we can use uh, to try to understand issues that are important to the community. And then also how to, how to spend our precious time and monetary resources um, and then uh, one last thing that I want the council to know is that as we're using the Polco platform for this survey, we do also have access to, um, to a surveying tool and um, are building a panel of Santa Cruz residents who will get notified anytime we have an engagement opportunity. So um, when we launched the district elections um, maps, the first set of maps, immediately got some responses on that um, on that effort and already have 60, 60 piece of people have weighed in um, on those maps uh, without us doing a lot of a lot of promotion as we were waiting on the decision moving forward. So just know that that's a resource to you and Jade, I'm sorry for interrupting you, but I wanted to get wanted you to get into the meat of everything and me to do my little preamble before you got started. So what? Please, please feel free to take it away, Jade, and thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, yeah, but no, no problem at all. I'm happy that you did that. Um, so, and I actually, before I jumped into the results, I actually wanted to thank Elizabeth for uh, she was our primary contact throughout the duration of this project. It's a pleasure to work with. Uh, very helpful throughout the survey development and implementation process. Um, but with that, let me go ahead and share my message. Everybody see that okay? Okay. So this, since this is your first time working with us, just a little bit of background about who we are. Um, so we are Polco's Black National Research Center. Uh, National Research Center has been a um, the premier community survey, citizen survey expert in the country for more than 25 years now. Um, and then back in 2019, we merged with online engagement platform Polco uh, work with local governments to engage their residents online. Um, so that brings a lot more functionality and um, capacity to these services that we are able to offer our clients uh, in addition to these regular community surveys such as the National Community Survey as Elizabeth already mentioned you have a lot more um, ability to do further outreach in the community using the platform. Talk a little bit more about that at the end of the presentation. Um, and so, before I dive into Santa Cruz's specific survey results, uh, just a really brief overview about what our clients usually use data for. So, um, most often, these survey results um, are used to monitor trends and resident opinion over time. As you conduct the survey again over time, you will establish a trend line and be able to identify um, increases and decreases ratings, measure about government performance and public trust ratings, um, to inform budget decisions as well as land use, strategic planning decisions. Uh, some of our clients even use their survey results 
to inform creating a strategic plan if they don't we have one. And finally, uh, we do have a, a robust uh, database, partly, um, but our clients also compare their own ratings to those to other. So the, the NCS the National Community Survey, this is a standardized five page template community survey. Uh, and it, it is structured around these 10 facets of community livability that you see on the screen. Um, we have found that these align most closely with the aspects of livability and community residents have identified as being most related to their quality of life where they live. Uh, in addition to that, it's also a great way to organize the results in the report um, in terms of usefulness by department. So um, different department heads can easily access their results both in the long PDF and then the report's also available on Tableau Public in a more interactive online format. Click through the tabs there. Uh, it's just great to the topic of choice. So that is how the overall format uh, of the reporting and the structure. And I do want to cover the methodology that we use for driving into the specific results for the city. So the survey was conducted from October 1st, or sorry, October 1st, 2021 to November 9th. Um, and we employed a hybrid for this. So there were a total of 27 households selected in the community. Um, these households were randomly selected and in order to um, complete that process, we start with lists of households that are provided by the U.S. Postal Service. We use USPS address lists because they are the most comprehensive and up-to-date, um, unlike some other lists, facility billing lists, voter registration records, which may not, which typically do not include the entire community. So starting with those USPS lists of households, we then geocoded each household um, within the zip codes that serve Santa Cruz to ensure that each household in the eligible list is actually within city limits. And then from that list, then identified as within city limits, we randomly selected 27 households to receive the survey invitation. These 27 house, 2,700 households were split into two groups. 1,200 received um, a three-part mailing, 1,500 received a two-part mailing. Uh, just for the get a little bit more into that. So that three-part mailing, that group A mailing, those folks received a postcard in the mail that included a specific survey online, um, as well as a web link so that they could go online. Okay? That was followed by a survey packet that included the five-page paper survey in the mail one week later, and followed by a second survey packet a week after that. Both of those uh, hard copy surveys were accompanied by a cover letter with instructions. Also included a web link so they could go online to complete it as well, uh, and a postage page. Which so that group, Group A, had the option to complete the survey either online or return the first survey in the mail. The 1500 Group B respondents, or recipients rather, um, they received two postcard invitations to complete the survey online, one week apart. The reason for this methodology is that we are, and especially in a new community, such as Santa Cruz, not, or hasn't conducted um, the NCS uh, or a survey like it in recent years, um, we are trying to gauge the difference in response between these two groups. And uh, it is far more cost effective to invite residents to take a survey online, as well as eco friendly to uh, be printing and mailing and a lot of. Um, lots of postage costs, et cetera. Um, so we are trying to gauge the difference in response rates between those who receive an online invitation versus those who receive survey in the mail um, and use that information to form our recommended methodology going forward in future survey years. We found a really robust survey response using this split method in Santa Cruz, a total of 474 responses received. And overall, response rate of 18%. Nationwide, we see that an average around 15 up to about 20%. So you all are, and then 20% is really on the high end for this um, hybrid approach. So increases the a, a, a 
successful launch rate. In addition to the probability based because of the random sample nature of the address selection, so in addition to that probability based test, we also conducted an online only open participation community wide survey. This survey opened about a month after those first mailings went out, a random sample survey. Uh, and that survey was promoted to the public at large, promoted on the city website, social media, uh, and we received 393 responses to that survey. Those data were collected separately with a different web link for the open participation survey. Uh, and so those two data sets were kept separate. The body of the report and the main results of the report reflect just the random sample responses to the survey. But you can also find separately the responses to the open participation survey toward the end of the PDF report um, and also the Tableau public report as well. Both of those were statistically weighted to reflect the demographics of Santa Cruz overall. Um, and we do that process, the statistical weighting process, uh, in order to make your results more representative of, of the community. I'll talk about that more in the next slide. Um, with 474 responses received to that scientific survey that gives us a plus or minus 4.5% margin of error, uh, which is great, but we shoot for a 5% or less margin of error for these types of surveys. So 4.5% is uh, um, perfect and well within what we like to see. Uh, on that subject, weighting, so this weighting table is also included in the report. Demographic weighting is an important part of survey research uh, because we hear from different, uh, a different uh, proportion of folks in different demographics than actually live in the community. So just to broadly generalize, we hear from far fewer residents who are young, residents who are of color, who are renters, who live in tax housing. Um, and um, slightly fewer male than female. So those are just very, very broad generalizations about who under response surveys. So this process is a typical approach to balancing that out. We look at um, census data and American community survey data and then we use statistical uh, adjustments to align the survey data so that they are more representative of your community as a whole. So I previously mentioned our national benchmark database. There are currently more than 500 comparison communities in this database across the nation. Uh, and these are communities that have surveyed within the five years. This data is fresh and relevant. Um, Santa Cruz also elected to compare their results to a custom subset of communities. So I will talk about that momentarily more um, in more detail. So getting into Santa Cruz's specific results, um, there are two broad questions on the survey asking about both quality and the importance of very broad uh, characteristics of the community and um, facets of community livability. So this first slide is showing the responses to that first quality question. Those percentages are combined excellent or good ratings for each. Uh, so again, reflect the um, the facts of community livability that I mentioned earlier, economy, safety, natural environment, et cetera. That same question, but asked on an important scale, percent essential or very important combined. And I'm showing you these two slides to show you how we populate our, our quality and importance also included in support. So we identify any facets that are located in that lower right quadrant of this uh, part as those that are have been rated relatively higher in importance, lower in quality than the other faculty livability. We use this information to inform some of the highlights that we've written and other next steps that we might recommend. So looking at the comparison to the national benchmarks, um, we out of total of number of items on the survey for which benchmark comparisons were available. Nine were rated higher than the national averages, seven were rated similar, and another 57 were rated lower than the national averages. 
And then, as I mentioned before, just go ahead to a custom tier benchmark. So these benchmarks are actually what will be reflected in the body of the report versus the national ones. Uh, this custom subset uh, for a group of communities that included those that are similar, all of the communities were in the same region as Santa Cruz, so Pacific region. And then also within that, further subsets of similar population size or as similar median household in Santa Cruz to try to identify other communities that are most likely. So within that custom subset, 13 items were, ranked high, were rated higher than the averages, 68 were similar, and then 42 were lower. And getting into the survey highlights, and I do want to point out these highlights are what stood out to us as survey researchers, uh, that there is a wealth of information in the report, further data points, and further highlights to be gained as well. And so our first key finding, safety is important to Santa Cruz. So when asked to rate, as I showed in those previous slides, when asked to rate both the quality and the importance of the overall feeling of safety in the city, residents gave this facet of livability a relatively lower quality rating and relatively higher importance rating. So uh, indicating that this is an area of focus. So ratings within this facet in general did tend to be lower than both national and peer community benchmark comparisons, um, particularly regarding safety um, in their neighborhoods and in the downtown area, but also from other types of uh, crime um, and um, safety for well. Looking at safety-related services, um, when evaluating these, uh, a majority of residents gave excellent workload rating to four out of the six of these safety-related services, and then two were, were rated positively by fewer than half. Of respondents with the police service and crime protection. And then these safety services were lower than the, these are again reflecting the peer community comparison. So ratings for EMS, ambulance, police services, and prevention were lower than the peer benchmark. These other ratings were similar to the peer. Second key finding services for unhoused residents is an emergent need. So in addition to the standardized questions on the survey for which we can provide benchmark comparisons, uh, there's also space on the survey for, uh, for our communities to ask custom questions as well. So we don't have benchmarks available for these unique custom questions. They vary from community to community. But this was a unique custom question in the survey. So this question gave gauge resident support for funding a variety of um, and about Nine in ten of residents strongly or somewhat supported um, the following um, items in this list related to unhoused residents. So, mental health crisis response services, developing affordable housing, reliable services for the unhoused, as well as outreach, outreach and case management services for the unhoused. And all of these go to the top of the priority list. And a different question that asked residents to rate the importance of addressing issues related. More than eight in 10 residents thought it was essential or very important for the to partner with other organizations uh, that provide services to people experiencing homelessness, outreach case management services. Um, about three quarters thought it was important for the city to create affordable housing opportunities, emergency shelter, the private excuse me, provide access to other services. They were least likely to rate increased enforcement of the city's camping laws as essential or very important. Getting to our third key finding, mobility is still a community priority. So survey respondents also gave relatively low quality ratings and relative overall quality of the transportation system in Santa Cruz. So this is another suggested area of community priority. Ratings for alternative 
transportation uh, tended to be similar to those given in other peer communities. Um, so roughly two thirds of residents gave positive reviews of bicycle and easy travel of walking in the city. About one quarter were pleased to easy travel by public transportation. Um, those were those services, walking, bicycle, tra public transportation, those were on par with the peer benchmark comparison. Um, vehicle related travel, easy travel, car traffic flow on major streets, those I am rated lower than the benchmark. Um, looking at participation in alternative transportation, however, Santa Cruz ended up ratings that were higher than the peer benchmark comparison. So uh, Santa Cruz residents were much more likely than those in other communities to have walked or bike instead of driving, and then more likely than others. Instead of alone. Uh, and then using transport public transportation, that 25% uh, had done that at least once in the past year of that year. And looking at mobility related services, most of these tended again to be similar to the more right, the beer benchmark, uh, with about 7 10 giving high marks. To street lighting, street cleaning, traffic timing, bus services, um, and then roughly one third there giving positive marks, sidewalk maintenance, traffic enforcement, street repair. Street cleaning and traffic enforcement were lower than those, those two benchmark comparisons. All others were similar. Uh, looking again at that priorities question for funding potential city projects, and I'll show that question in full at towards the end of the presentation. Um, a, at least nine in 10 residents strongly or somewhat supported the city funding, maintaining the city streets, roads, sidewalks, and other public facilities. And at least eight in 10 supported city increasing sustainable transportation as less than here. Our fourth key finding, the natural environment is the future of truth. So more than eight in 10 residents gave positive ratings to the overall quality of the natural environment through higher than both the national and peer community benchmark comparison. And then ratings for air quality, preservation of natural areas, water, also above peer community averages, uh, and, and um, natural environment, environment related services, yard waste preservation, open space, etc. Um, these were rated positively by at least six in 10 residents and were similar to or higher than those peer community compared as well. Rating their level of support for initiatives related to the national environment. Uh, so most residents voiced strong support for funding each of these. These included addressing the impact of climate change, mitigating risk of wildfires, in open space and natural areas, and then maintain parks, spaces, and recreational facilities. About nine in 10 residents voice support for each. Fifth and final key finding, the economy is a potential area focused for the city, with affordability particularly acute too. And so about nine in 10 residents gave positive ratings to Santa Cruz with the visit, which was higher than both the national and peer benchmark. And then ratings for other um, aspects of economy tended to be similar to or lower than those given, given in other peer communities. Uh, those that were lower included cost of living, affordable quality housing, and economic development. Um, I do want to mention while we are on this slide that uh, cost of living and affordable quality housing, uh, while this is lower than the, the national and the peer benchmark comparisons, um, we have also seen, um, since this is the first time that you are serving with us, since you don't have trend lines for this data, I do want, just want to highlight here that we've seen decreases in these two areas in particular, both regionally in the Pacific region itself in the last couple of years in particular. I wanted to highlight that. Um, looking at items specifically related to Job, jobs and affordability. So um, developing affordable housing for low and moderate income households and support for local businesses. Um, at least nine in 10 residents strongly 
how much support is that? And then supported improving down to crews, recruiting businesses and jobs to the city, well, job training programs. This was the um, policy question, the, the city funding question in its entirety. Um, I did talk about each of these pieces individually as they related to the different facets to highlight the fact that the question in its entirety as well as the question on um, the impact of people experiencing homework versus how they were on that comment. And this is a recap of the conclusions I just covered. Uh, some of our suggested steps for digging deeper. Um, just already spoke about this, but you do have the opportunity to follow up as much as you like on the social platform. Um, and we highly encourage our clients to do so. You have ongoing access to that platform as well as your subscriber, existing subscriber base, which will continue to grow over time as you continue to conduct surveys on the platform. So, some of our suggestions um, we do offer a business survey for business owners and managers. Um, since economy was, again, really um, identified as an area of focus, we also have an economic development and workforce survey available, uh, a law enforcement and policing survey, uh, the national law enforcement survey. Um, and then we also have, so those top three items here, we have full surveys on those areas that are available to you. And then um, additionally, we have a number, hundreds really, of individual questions available in our library on the FOCO platform. Quite a few of those relate um, that was identified as one of the um, areas for city funding in that uh, custom question. So some opportunity there for follow-up as well. And then um, yeah, there's, as I have mentioned in Elizabeth too, but I don't want to um, belabor this point, but lots and lots of opportunity for further out outreach on the platform um, when I checked about 15 minutes ago. Um, I believe Santa Cruz had 540 panel uh, subscribers already. Um, so that is from survey efforts that you've already conducted. Each time uh, residents are invited to take a survey online on the Polko platform, they're asked if they would like to subscribe to the, the city's profile. So that will build your subscriber base over time and give you um, a larger and larger panel to engage with over time. Happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Jake. Um, but are there any council members with questions for Jade or for Elizabeth Smith? Council member Cohen Terry Johnson. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, that was amazing amount of information filled into what you just provided. So I appreciate that. Um, I, I don't really know who this question goes to, maybe Elizabeth. Um, I'm just wondering how we will look at this really rich information in comparison to what we collect locally. And I'm thinking about um, the community assessment project survey that's done every other year and indicators for the four outcomes at the end of the county level. So is there a plan for us to, I mean, the, the comparison here is really great. Is there a plan for us to see how where, how and where it aligns and there's a lot of alignment with the areas that we are looking at here and the areas around poor conditions at the survey, um, which is what we've used and embedded into the health and all policies of measuring our success. So just where is all of, the, where is the intersectionality? I think, I think there's a lot of, we have, you know, honestly, there. Um, that's that's territory that we haven't um, charted yet, and I think there is opportunity. However, I want to be clear. You know, this is a sp really specific set of data, and and we want to make sure that we are sort of it's it's um, encapsulated in this set of data, and we don't want to make assumptions on how it connects to other data. But I do think that there are ways that we what trends are we're seeing across. And if there are any sort of trends in sort of vertical demographic areas that we need to look at as a as a city, um, but uh, I think that is to be determined. Mostly, I just wanted to get us on a regular schedule of having some benchmarks so that our council members had uh, data to go on, and our department heads had data to go on on where are our community's priorities, 
unrelated to any other issue, but just general quality of so um but I love I love your idea, Shebra. So I, I will check into that and look into how we can create that at least in your strategic planning process or mm -hmm. other times where we have inflection for planning and um and assessment. Great. Thank you. Yeah, I think um I mean those other um areas th those other surveys and areas I've talked about are more at the county level so I don't I haven't seen anything this robust and rich at the city level so it's really great um, and maybe we can as health and all policies subcommittee connect with you and talk about what that next step could be. thank you for the work this, this is so exciting as a grant writer to see data like this that's like zeroed in it makes me really happy so thank you thank you council member Carolyn Perry Johnson uh, Council Member Myers. Yeah, I wanted to thank um, thank our presenter and and um, just also recognize how much information in here. Um, and I, yeah, I guess maybe asking. I just had a question. I guess for our city manager or um, sort of how how do you see this sort of getting used and to work ahead around you know some of our main work areas or is this something that the council can use for example in a strategic planning session or kind of where does this fit in our sort of role as policy for mine yeah thanks council member myers I, I would echo elizabeth's comments i think it's a really powerful tool to help inform the council's future work around strategic planning i think it also sheds some light on and provides some really helpful context to some of the other survey work done uh, we did the poll just a couple of weeks ago that was, you know, just focused on likely voters. This uh, this survey is much broader than that, and I, I also shows fairly significant alignment of what the community is telling us is most important, what areas they want us to prioritize, and it allows us to be intentional as we work through this plan as well as um, the upcoming budget process, or that. Uh, that information is reflected um, collective decisions to make. So I'm excited about it as well. I'm a, I'm a data nerd, uh, like many of us are, and uh, also always take opportunities data-driven approach to the work we're doing. But I see this as being a really powerful tool that we can continue doing and, and use this as a baseline. Um, yeah, I, 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 you know, if, if, if between the uh, the polling we did a couple, you know, three weeks ago now and the, this data, I mean, I, to me, it, I think it, it reflects on, you know, a lot of the emphasis we've done over the last year and a half. So is, you know, we're on track with, with doing, whether that's housing production, um, the economic development steps that were done, you know, after, before and after COVID, I guess we're always gonna be in COVID. But also, more importantly, some of the public safety, some of the homeless policy as well. I think it's all tracking with requests that the community and have us engage policy. So um, it's, it's, yeah, it's a great, great set of data. Thank you, Thank you for doing it, the work. Thank you for the thorough report. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Council Member Brown? Mayor, and thank you so much uh, for this this wonderful presentation. Uh, really did cover uh, a lot of information you know, very clearly, precisely, and the report itself is so rich. Um, and I'm already mining it for, to use that data, um, you know, for various uh, effort community efforts. And um, so I, I guess I wanted to add, and I am a big fan of data. I um, super appreciate the robustness of survey methodology, all of the tools that um, have access to now uh, this platform, and I'm really looking forward to continuing to, to utilize it and you know, dig deeper as the suggested at the end of the presentation. Um, so I guess, um, you know, and, and I, Without, I'm not going to make a whole bunch of comments on um, what I see in terms of how we're tracking with what um, 
participants in the survey suggest are important to them with respect to quality of life. Um, I, I do see some discrepancies around the, you know, kind of our, our homelessness response and um, particular, and then around housing as well. And I, I understand we are, um, I mean, are the, the interest in addressing these challenges there. Um, and we're also hearing or seeing in this data that, or in these data that we aren't ranked we're, we're not ranked very well in some of those areas. And um, so I, I guess I, I'm, I'm wondering in particular around development questions. Um, is that, an, and I guess this is a question for, uh, for uh, well, I guess I'll, I'll just put it out there. Um, Maybe Elizabeth and um, Dade for, for sure. Are there tools available through this platform that can help us dig into questions around land use and development, um, and and you know, so I guess I just if that's the case, I'd really like for the city to pursue that because I think that the data itself, I mean, it tells us something. But um, one of the reasons that I tend to in my own work that I do as a researcher try to incorporate additional more depth interviews and that diving deeper because you don't get the why as much right i mean we don't know if people are, are not ranking uh you know police response why what is that about right um people are saying you know the quality of development is where we're lower compared to comparable communities what is that about is it people thinking there's not enough or is it actual quality of Structures. So, you know, a lot of those um, uh, lies I think are, are important for us to do in kind of get that dive. Um, and then I guess I kind of following up on Member Calentary Johnson's point about how this might be integrated into the work uh, that around health and all policies. You know, it feels like a uh, really great opportunity, and and I get that this this data doesn't um, correspond necessarily with some of the other survey data we have. Um, however, it provides some really interesting um, information that I think bears thinking about how we ask those questions. Like, are the recommendations are our policy is our policy agenda with the findings of this survey um, as survey respondents defining their views on the health of the community. So um, I'm, I, I do hope that the health policy staff take that on and wrestle with how to, how to best uh, to improve and our policy. And just to briefly address you know, some of the, the topics that you brought up, we absolutely do have uh, multiple questions that have been asked by other in other communities that have been vetted by survey experts that you can post to the platform. That is, um, I love you know, you, um, something that we often say in survey research is that a survey such as this one can tell you about what residents think, but not why they think it. And the POCO platform gives you the opportunity to do a little bit more of a qualitative approach. So, you know, you can ask these shorter form questions that you might only have a few questions, but there's open, there's an opportunity for residents to write in a response or to, in their own words, comment on a particular topic. So um, that is a really, really nice um, opportunity to engage with residents on that. And then, yes, and we have um, entire surveys on law enforcement, as I mentioned, and on economic development, um, but also individual questions relating to other more um, specific topics like land use. And development. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Cumming. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for that presentation. This was really great. Uh, I don't unexpected it, you know, in terms of things come forward, and it was really great to see the survey that was conducted and all the 
the valuable data that's there. I'm just kind of wondering, um, this is more out of curiosity um, than anything else, but I'm just wondering um, if there's any way this information can be taken into consideration for revenue measure by the revenue subcommittee. It seems like there's a lot of information about sentiments around business, workforce development, housing, safety, public safety. So I'm just wondering, you know, what thought there is, or if there's an opportunity for us to, you know, with any polling that has been done, to um, kind of juxtapose the data that we're getting that polling against what's coming out of this survey to just kind of see how two different types of surveys um, like what the community is. I think the survey results um, are, have strong alignment question that revenue is pouring personal tax measure. It has strong alignment what we conduct like years. Uh, as I look at um, what themes this survey really underscores, the community is telling us loud and clear uh, that they have concerns around our lack of asking around homelessness response. I think the community is telling us loud and clear that we have a need for more affordable housing, really put sustainable solutions in place around housing affordability uh, and availability. And I think the community has also continued uh, to share um, across the last poll conducted that um, there's a strong um, interest in ensuring um, a safe and healthy community. I think that applies downtown as well, both in this survey as well as all of those are planning to prioritize uh, if the council uh, chooses. So, having said all of that, bringing this data back to the subcommittee, I think, is a great idea. We can ensure that the information that the is telling us really aligns with the current direction we're going. Uh, but based on the key themes, I think we're moving in the right direction. Okay, those are all my comments. So. Uh, just thanks again for that survey and for taking the time to meet with us this evening to discuss this. Just one more plug. There is the results are posted on our website in the community relations section of the city manager's department. Um, there's also uh, the results are there in Tableau. So those of you who are true data nerds can go in there and play around and highlight different things that you want to do. And then if there are any follow up questions, if you dig into the data, have questions or you want to or you want to initiate some sort of outreach um, by all means let me know I am here to investigate um, things that are important to you um, we have 500 people ready and waiting to take surveys so um, and then we'll be looking to build that um, build that platform even bigger so that we can get more representative um, information so um, thanks thanks for the time and the ability to bring this to you tonight Thanks for your enthusiasm over having some data in your. Thank you so much, uh, Elizabeth, and thank you, Jade. Um, just all the categories that uh, were there, I think the was labeled livability of Santa community livability and really, you know, having those different categories of safety and law enforcement, mobility and transportation and, um, you know, some of the health and wellness and engagement. And um, it's really a great start. I'm glad we'll be doing that uh, on a regular basis. And um, I'm excited to go to the website. And can you say one more time, Elizabeth, where that is on our cityofsantacruz.com website? Sure, if you go to the the city manager section on the website, okay. there's, a, there's a link for community relations. It's okay. just below that link there in community relations. Um, and we'll just, we'll update that with um, additional surveys as they become available. And then as we do more engagement, we can create more of an engagement hub there um, on all sorts of topics. Um, so we're just getting started. Wonderful. Um, that concludes council member questions. Thank you so much, Jade Barocha, for joining us. Thank you, Elizabeth Smith.
Thank you all. Thank you for your time and your Thank information. You. Thank you. We um, have one more item on our agenda, and um, it's oral communication at 6.30. Um, since it is time certain, I will go ahead and um, call for a break, and we will return at 9 p.m. and continue with oral. Thank you so much. Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you. Many hours of mute. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Wait. Three. Hey, or while we're waiting, if I could ask, um, I received a call during the break from somebody who was persistently trying to raise a hand to do the so I I would deliver that um and um, there. I'm not yeah. sure if um cause for having issues, but I did see his hand club a few times, but after he was a comment and while you guys were already in Okay. Uh, I'm going out to attendees. Is he there now? I his name on the I yeah. had attendees okay. on our list. Um, and and so you know at this time we voted on the item and so um, I'm happy to have him. Um, oh, there's his hand. Hand is up. And so before I go into communications, I'm happy to um, open up that time for him to comment on that item before we go into oral communications or after. I think since oral communications is time certain, maybe we should do that first. And then I'm happy to go um, and allow him that time to speak on item number four. So hopefully you can stay on. I do see your hand is working now. Thank you so much, Council Member Brown, for bringing that to our attention. Um, okay, so oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not agenda. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in and instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you are interested in addressing the council, raise your hand either by dialing star nine on your phone or selecting raise hand in the webinar controls on your computer. You will have three minutes. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly State your name before making your comment so that we can accurately capture in the meeting minute, however it is not required. Please remember, this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with a member of the public, but when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communication. So I will go out to our attendees. And the first person with their hand raised for oral communications is, I am watching you. Hi. I cannot state more strongly the city's support for the mockeries of basic individual rights and the COVID mandates must now have a defined end date. There never was, and now it is CDC admitted after scores of studies, the cloth mask did nothing to stop COVID except promote fear and control. 
that unvaccinated people must still wear masks is irrational fear-mongering totalitarian get the jab coercion assisted by legacy media government collusion promotion numerous studies show vaccine protection wanes and some indicate it actually goes negative meaning eventually the vaccinated become more likely to contract COVID at some point and serious side effects have been ignored there is no rational scientific or moral reason to mandate coercive endless annual jabs with all the associated side effects, including death. Even Bill Gates now admits Omicron did more for immunity than the vaccines ever did with some estimated 75% Omicron immunity with only 10% of the Delta morbidity. That the mandates never did stop COVID, that those policies ignored the intense stratification of age health risk, as well as the better natural immunity, the max suffering from lockdowns is still ignored, Zero risk children still suffer and must wear a mask because some teachers are Karen cowards. That Omicron is really just a bad flu like so many before. That effective outpatient treatments are still being denied and zero prioritized. That children are callously targeted to avoid big pharma's vaccine liability. All these points when in moral greed, totalitarian power lust, corruption, a revolving door CDC, FDA, lapdog to big pharma and a turning point where individual liberty and informed consent is either lost or saved. The unjustified $1,000 fines for walking on the beach or persecuting people without useless masks on in Trader Joe's will be on the wrong side of history. Every single person I saw in Safeway on Saturday was still wearing a useless cloth mask, and after that, all his baseless fear mandate was partially lifted. Santa Cruz is loaded with the government and co-conspirator media lied to, brainwashed, state-worshipping, state-dependent, cult-like collectivists, including communists, the DSA types, or even loving other blamers. So I don't expect much protest here against the state, stale state's destructive authoritarianism, but my message is it's time to take all the mandate chains off people's lives with or without mass protest. A January 31st Monmouth University poll showed about 70% of Americans agree with this statement, Time we accept that COVID is here to stay and we just need to get on with our lives. Uh, on a different matter, I'd also like to mention government by opinion polls subvert a more proper, direct, detailed, rational dialogue between the people and government. Almost none of the questions in the National Committee survey were related to demographics. The intense overweighting for young people and the intense underweighting of older respondents is a poor and false assumption that everyone in a demographic thinks alike. Okay, thanks. Thank you for calling in for oral communication. I am going to um, go to caller ending in 7407. Go ahead, welcome. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, on my screen, I wasn't able to raise my hand, but I can see the uh, members of the public how to comment, like the instructions are on my screen. So I'm actually using my phone. Great. My name is Elise. Thank you. My name is Elise Casby, and I'm very sorry I missed the uh, agenda item on redistricting and the vote going to ballot. I think that would be tragic, but I'm calling in to talk about. Um, a concept that I've recently found um, after some research called inverted totalitarianism, inverted totalitarianism. And the reason I want the public to know about this is because it has become so incredibly difficult to really have any voice within our so-called democracy. And I think Santa Cruz is a, a really good example of how our public voice has been all but extinguished through, you know, the sham and very, very deceitful, dishonest recall, uh, where big money and lies that were utilized and smearing and, you know, in the Sentinel, um, which really was quite a disservice to the public, uh, the way the Sentinel made it look like our old, um, the, um, our progressive council members who were unseated um, through the the very dishonest and uh, recall process. This district redistricting is another one of these. Um, let's do everything we can to create a very top-down authoritarian government structure. 
structure. Um, and so, of course, you're putting it to ballot. I didn't see the vote, but I imagine that you voted for it. You're putting it to ballot on June 7th, which is a time when the least number of people go to the polls. I think it's very important that the public start to understand uh, the nature of the, um, you know, our, our true situation with the democracy. I recommend Sheldon Wollen, S-H-E-L, I think it's D-O-N, Sheldon Wollen, W-O-L-I-N. I found out about Sheldon Wollen uh, by reading Chris Hedges, an old article. And uh, Sheldon Wollen is now deceased. But I think the type of inverted totalitarianism that we're facing is um, it's, it's, it's being uh, pro uh, what's the word, promulgated from both the right and the left, this um, extreme corporate, big money, government uh, environment where the community has so little voice. And I think Santa Cruz has, okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Elise, for calling in for oral communications. Um, are there any other callers for oral communications um, before I move on to Stephen Bosworth? Um, attendees, I don't see any other hands up. Um, so that will conclude oral communications. Oh, we do have one more. We have Richard Lewis. Go ahead, Richard. Thank you. Hi there. Unmute yourself. There's either a star. Unmute yourself on your phone or unmute yourself. Hi, John. Hi there. At 83, it's not easy. To, when I found you, yes, thank and you. Justin and Martine, you remember fifth grade, those young people had something to say. You both attended that grade. Not going into any of it, I know that take on a block. That block where the warming center is, we've got vets there, we got no papers. So all I want is your vision. How we can take county city. Something that focuses on, as Martinez certainly knows, health doesn't start in the hospital, start in the community. So I'm on to listen, but this was the first time because I watched your meetings on the TV, but now I really get to see you. So I am definitely with good ideas. How about a youth mayor and a youth city council? How about using the resources in Cabrillo from your vision? So what, for what best I can do is not create one more bigger or better, so United Way or you name them. But Yes, and I remember when I first met with Easter. Let's see what we can do. Now, the idea is you can't do in three minutes. But we can't have a cup of coffee, as Starbucks speaks to, one cup at a time, one neighborhood at a time. And so I look, learn more about how a mayor at age 25 would come to be with your leadership. I hope I spoke great. So, you know, I will follow up the conversation with an email to all of you. Over and out. Thank you. Thank you so much, Richard Lewis, for your oral communication. And um, if there are no further oral communications, I don't see any other hands. Um, I will close oral communications. And I will open it up for in Bosworth for public comment item 14. Go ahead, Stephen.
and mute yourself. Yes, can you hear me now? Yes, welcome. Ah, right, finally got through to you after yes. all my attempts. Thank you very much for taking this late, <laughs> uh, coming into your meeting. I'd be very much pleased if you felt it's going fine to give me feedback, good. But if not, I hope you thought and uh, the later outreach your planning will help the process uh, better. Okay. Uh, this, uh, uh, um, item number 14. Um, oh, yeah. The name of the uh, I interrupt? I am yes. having a hard time hearing you. You moved away maybe from the device. Okay. Yes. Okay. Go. Okay. I'll try again. Um, the aim of the California Voting Rights Act is to treat each citizen equally, to remove as much vote dilution as possible from our protected classes. As you know, a deleted vote is one that has not helped to elect a favored candidate. For example, the 2018 and 2020 election that produced the existing council diluted 50, sorry, 54 percent of all the votes cast by citizens. Yet neither the pros proposed seven district model nor the six district model with an elected mayor at large make likely that less than half of all the citizens' votes cast will continue to be wasted, diluted, since meant by the California Rights Act. In fact, this mixture of elections still seems so to violate the California Voting Rights Act. This makes it also vulnerable to challenge. Half of the vote wasted would not be so bad if there wasn't a better way available for elected council. But California's election code explicitly offers a better method in its chapter two. It is called multi-seat ranked choice voting. San Francisco, Berkeley, Oakland, and many cities elsewhere use ranked choice voting. This method invites each citizen to express their different judgments about the candidate, first choice, second, and so forth. Consequently, about 88% of all the votes cast help to elect a winner they have favored. Not half of all the votes wasted, no, but only about 12. On a different issue, it is important to note that California's Attorney General has made it clear that the California Voting Rights Act does not require the adoption of districts. This, that claim has been made many times in this in the previous Zoom. Thank you, Stephen. Your oh. time is up. The timer has run up three minutes. Uh, I understand that, but if there's no one else wanting to talk, I would appreciate it if you would want to talk maybe uh, three or four more minutes at all. Uh, I, I have to I have to end it at three minutes. Okay, that's, uh, that's your rule. Thank you so much for calling in. I'm glad you were able to get through. Okay. So with that, as our last item of public comment and oral communications is done, um, and I um, uh, would like to say this meeting um, is adjourned and um, would also like to encourage anybody else who would like to email City Council at videosantacruz.com if there are any further comments, we'll receive them there. Thank you so much. This meeting is adjourned. Good night, everybody.